Uh, welcome to the first meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. Um, the first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Thank you very much. So let's move to agenda item two which is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's Wildlife Crime in Scotland Annual Report 2015. We are being joined today by two panels. In the first instance, can I welcome Gary Aitken, who is the Head of Wildlife and Environmental Crime at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Steve Johnson, Assistant Chief Constable, and Sean Scott, Detective Chief Superintendent of Police Scotland. Welcome, gentlemen. We will move uh, straight to questions. And the first questions are from... Who are they from? Kate Forbes. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, in terms of this report, in previous years there's been some criticism of the way that the data has been presented and so it's good to see the data this year presented by financial years. Can you identify what are the key difficulties in comparing the wildlife crime statistics and how perhaps in future years the data could be further enhanced? Good morning. Uh, perhaps an overview. Statistics, uh, damn lies and statistics, I suppose, is, is probably a good start. Um, one of the problems I think that we have in Police Scotland is, is moving from the legacy force arrangements into one whole Police Scotland. Uh, we still don't have uh, a whole Police Scotland crime recording system from which we can extrapolate the data. So if you like, we're, we're, we're still evaluating old data sets with um, an incoherent and inconsistent data set that we still have in Police Scotland until we get that system. Um, where it's strong, though, is it does, it does give a general indication of either direction of travel or the amount of activity that is taking place. Um, in this particular area, in terms of wildlife crime, one of the problems with statistics is, is low number uh, and actually the fragility of that low number. When you spread the data across the whole of Scotland, you start to get into single case. And for me, that's, that's really important to note because I think the move that certainly I want to bring as the, as the lead for Police Scotland is yeah, the, the numbers are important and, and certainly we want to see some positive correlations around the activity of partners and the police in terms of protecting wildlife and, and wild species. But actually, I want to get into the qualitative. I want to start to understand the metrics of the data right from a member of the public calling us to say they've got some concerns about something right the way through to colleagues in, in the Crown. And what, what's the attrition from there's something suspicious or there's a crime potentially happened there to uh, a, a non-criminal justice outcome? But also, I think there's something about the statistics of there's nothing in the report, and certainly I would welcome uh, an, an offer to provide some support in providing data around what's, what's the health of the species that we're trying to protect. So, so there's no comment there in terms of raptor persecution. We've got a lot of statistics around wildlife crime in relation to raptors, uh, and we can compare that to 2012, 2010, 2011, and that's fantastic. We, we have an idea of the activity. But what's the outcome? What's it for? What is the current health in Scotland of the raptor flock? Um, and, and is that better than 2010 or worse? And, and if it's worse, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to move into that preventative space? How are we going to move into that enforcement space? And what are we doing about the intelligence gaps that we have to make that assertion as to whether it's a good thing or a bad thing? And I would say that in relation to all the six priority areas highlighted in the report, really welcome some context of where does this sit along the overall performance or the outcomes in relation to what we're seeking to achieve? So I certainly welcome the clarity that it provides year on year, um, but I think there's probably a bit more work that we can do to say, well, is that having a positive outcome or is it just statistics for the state sake of statistics? Back, you're back to your opening comments. Given what you said there about um, the lack of an overall Scotland picture, how robust is this report? How much stores should we put by it? Well, I think, I think you can say that it's robust insofar as the integrity of the data is the data that we've been provided and the, we've pulled in all the information across different systems as, as best we possibly can. The ideal for me would be that, that we have a, a crime recording system uh, that's linked to an incident recording system. So right from somebody making the first call about a suspicion of um, uh, an area of, of, of scientific importance, that call and following the attrition right the way through, if you like, police systems or partner systems to the point in which we can do that. And, and we don't have that integrated system. We, we do have a, a capital bid in to try and improve part of our ICT infrastructure to enable that to happen. And I'm sure over time that will happen. 
But the data is, is good data based on the information that we hold at the moment. Could it be better? Yes, because technology would allow us to go down to different layers of granularity because we could record it at the point of origin with different layers of granularity, i.e. right from the call handler, we could geocode the data, we could code the issue, and we can follow that code all the way through an integrated system. Okay. Uh, Kate Forbes. In terms of... Um recording and reporting um, the data and where you'd like to move towards, what changes have to be made to get to that position? I think, uh, I thank you for the opportunity as well. Um, one of the other hats I wear uh, in my, my current portfolio is uh, leading the National Crime Managers Forum, which uh, is recorded crime management. So uh, there is work ongoing to, uh, to uh, design and create this single crime recording system, which, which will be absolutely a, a benefit to everyone. Uh, I mean, this report uh, shows improvement in the fact that obviously we've disaggregated uh, the reporting into the crime priority areas, which wasn't there previously. So that's a, an encouraging improvement. And I think when we do get to a, a single crime recording system nationally, then we'll be able to get far more detailed uh, and informative data for, for the committee and, and the government to, to assess. So, so that work is ongoing just now. Uh, don't ask me for a date of completion, because I can't give you that. Uh, there's a, a number of factors uh, that will influence that, but um, we're, we're making steps in that regard. One last question. Um, there, were th there were three <coughs> recommendations from the previous RACI committee which weren't included in, in this year's report. Those were um, presenting data on a quarterly break, uh, basis, a breakdown of COPFS resources applied to wildlife crime, and then lastly, the impact of land reform legislation in wildlife crime. What steps are being taken to include um, or to work on those three recommendations for next year? In terms of the Crime Office, uh, one, Gary. Well, so far as our resources are concerned, I think there's a, a parliamentary question in relation to that at the moment. The resources are reasonably steady across the piece. We have four core lawyers involved in the Wildlife and Environmental Crime Unit over the period that the report covers. Uh, and beyond that, I'm not sure that there's much more that can be usefully said about our resourcing. What I would say is that as a proportion of our total workload, that's actually quite a, a positive proportion of staff devoted to the area, and that's as it should be. It recognises the, the importance of this for us as an organisation and for Scotland as a whole. Uh, so far as the other aspects are concerned, I'm not really in a position to comment so much on that. Thank you. Alexander Bonnet. Uh, thank you, and good morning. <coughs> um, I wonder if you could just give some more clarity on the difference between uh, an incident and a crime uh, and the definition of it, um, you know, another dictionary definition of it, where an offence is committed. Uh, but I think you've, you've sort of correctly gone, uh, explained a little. Uh, there's a difference between a member of the public calling to report concerns, which you would lodge as an incident, uh, and then there's an attrition rate uh, on that all the way through something being reported to the Procurator Fiscal to, to, to a conviction. Uh, but a number of organisations seem to be reporting uh, incidents as crimes as they're starting off level. Is that, is that correct or, or do you think the definition should be, or could, could you maybe clarify? You're absolutely right. Um, there is attrition, uh, the public perception of what may be a, a wildlife crime uh, is based on obviously their knowledge of what they see at the time, they report it and then we investigate it. Um, for example, you know, a, a wildlife incident can be recorded like a swan on the road uh, and you know, creating a, you know, a, a vulnerability to traffic. That, that is occasionally recorded as a wildlife crime incident, but then when we investigate it, it isn't actually a wildlife crime. Uh, so, uh, so there are a number of instances where the public perceives. So, for example, in terms of badgers, there might be a, a couple of men walking a dog into, uh, into the woods, and that might be recorded as potentially a, a wildlife crime in relation to badgers, but then when you investigate it, there's no disturbance to set, then, then it's, it's, it's not a wildlife crime. So there's two instances where a wildlife incident may be recorded as such, but it doesn't then extrapolate into a recorded wildlife crime. Uh, and it'll be closed off, that incident, on our uh, storm uh, incident recording system as non-crime, if you like. So. so do you think that's a flaw in the way statistics are currently being presented that's going to be cleared up by your new definition? By the I don't know if it's a process. flaw. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the public, uh, when they phone in, we want them to phone in, you know, whenever they think something might be uh, afoot. Uh, and uh, so their perception, as I say, is based on their knowledge. So we welcome that, we encourage it, uh, and then we'll investigate it. And if it transpires that it's not actually a crime, then it's a false alarm of good intent, effectively. So, uh, so we'd, we'd welcome that and we encourage it uh, greatly. Yeah. Yeah. 
think in terms of it's an opportunity as well missed if we don't go back and explain what we've done uh, and whether it was or wasn't a crime. Um, you know, I think people will report it to the police and they will expect some sort of activity that follows. And I think the way that the statistics are currently reported, the activity that people are seeking to see is something around a criminal justice disposal at the end of it. Um, I think uh, on conversations with colleagues, there's an awful lot of activity goes on uh, in, the, in the local policing areas where they'll follow those inquiries up, they'll meet with the people, they'll do an awful lot of work to either engage with the person to ascertain whether a crime has been committed or not, and then they'll investigate appropriately. But if one hasn't, then they can use that opportunity to, to move into that preventative space where we're informing people, uh, we're actually telling people what it is that we're doing or what we're seeking to achieve in a broader preventative agenda. So sometimes I think we just need to understand that and we need to follow the journey. Uh, technology will enable us to do that better and move into that qualitative space where, where I can sit down with Sean and say, well, okay, just, just take me through then, because we've had a whole series of these, and, and what are we doing at the back end of it? Are we making sure that we're sharing that information with partners so that we're not taking un undue or adverse criticism unnecessarily? Or are we identifying learning opportunities where we and partners can do something differently? Um, so uh, it, it could be viewed negatively, but at the moment I'm trying to view it as, a, as, as an opportunity for us to, to improve on our practice. And that is something that happens right across the criminal justice sphere the public and others report all sorts of incidents to the police which are correctly recorded as incidents and investigated some will turn out to be crimes some will turn out not to be it's we're focused on wildlife crime here but there's quite a an overlap with the way the whole of the rest of the system works okay let, let's start to look at some of the stats, accepting that there are difficulties in comparing stats across reporting years, because some prosecutions will occur uh, out with the year in which the, the crime was committed. But if we look at um, the fact that there's an 11% increase in recorded wildlife crime in 2014-15 compared to 13-14, um, is that because there's been an improvement in reporting or a genuine increase in wildlife crime in certain areas? I can, I can cover it from a policing perspective if you'd like. I, th I think for me, um, candid answer is, I don't, I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, I think what I can say is, uh, looking through the statistics that we have available us in the background data, is where we have full-time wildlife crime officers, we see an increase in reporting. We have six full-time wildlife crime officers in the different divisions, uh, and we have a number of part-time wildlife crime officers. Um, the increase is, is that year-on increase. It's still lower than the previous years and previous reporting. Uh, I think credit must go to my predecessor, uh, ACC Malcolm Graham. In the period up to me taking post and taking on this portfolio, an awful lot of the work has been about building the infrastructure and the resources. And certainly the number of full-time resources that we have in Police Scotland put towards this has increased and it's now stable. There's over 100 police officers that have been trained in relation to wildlife crime. Uh, and certainly we're moving towards training more special constables of having that knowledge. Now, the, the greater knowledge that we have out there and the, great, the greater access to police officers with that knowledge from the public, I think we will see an increase in reporting. And, and I go back to an earlier point is as to whether there's more wildlife crime taking place or people are more confident in coming to us with that report or um, we're more readily accessible because we have the structures and infrastructure in place, uh, I, I wouldn't say I have the maturity of the data to, to provide an, an absolute view on that. But what I will say is it's, it's, it's something where we, we can track that and I think where the evidence does suggest full-time wildlife crime officers has that benefit in people having direct access. They can report offences to those people and the confidence that comes from that. That's clearly something I can learn from and certainly talk about in terms of the resources that we have. And if we can't afford for it to be full-time, how we make that knowledge of those officers with the skills available to the local community. I think yeah, but something that perhaps you could, one, one of, of you could perhaps answer then is, why has there been a 14 point drop in the number of crimes that have referred to the Crown Office this year, 35% in comparison to 49%? Could be any number of reasons. I mean, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the crimes reported, uh, as we all know, there are significant, uh, or there can be significant evidence gathering uh, challenges with wildlife crime in terms of where, where they are uh, committed, uh, the isolation, the remote, uh, you know, parts of the country where they, where they, uh, they transpire, uh, the evidence gathering elements in terms of lack of CCTV, lack of witnesses, lack of uh, social media, uh, open source. Uh, there's a there's a huge amount of difficulties there in investigating wildlife crime, but. Uh, 
So that that could be part of it, uh, as you're aware, and as the report uh, says, you know, we're making uh, significant strides in terms of use of forensics and uh, specialist support in investigating wildlife crime. So every every case has its own idiosyncrasies and own challenges. Uh, so that, and when we'll pursue every every evidential uh, opportunity that we can in order to try and uh, and uh, achieve an outcome. Yes, but 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 look, let's look at the trend here. Um, it's acknowledged that there have been additional resources made available to Police Scotland, to ta or made available by Police Scotland to tackle wildlife crime. The Crown Office has specialist uh, lawyers dealing with this, and yet we're still seeing a nine-point drop in conviction rates this year. Um, why? If you put all this together, why are we where we are this year? With the numbers of cases going through, a percentage drop in conviction rate can be quite a, a blunt tool for looking at these cases. It's not necessarily a great number, a different number of cases being dealt with. And from my point of view, the important thing is to have enough evidence to take a case to court. We can't guarantee a conviction once a case is in court nor should we try to do so. The court is there to determine the truth of the situation. So I, I wouldn't be overly concerned about a, a percentage difference in conviction rates for numbers of, of these kind. But if we're putting all these resources to it, you have forensic resources now available to look at some of these crimes. Surely we should be seeing an upturn in these figures. I think, I mean, for example, uh, you know, we delivered uh, through investigations uh, and reports of uh, potential wildlife crime uh, 70 uh, raptors to uh, SASA during the period, uh, but only 10% of them transpired to have any illegal substance, if you like, within uh, the bird. So there's a huge amount of effort goes to try and get that evidence, uh, but sometimes it's not there because the birds may have died because of natural causes or, or other reasons. So, um, so there, there is, you know, significant effort put in to trying to get that evidence where, uh, uh, within limited evidential gathering opportunities. So, we just want to get some of this detail into the report in future to better explain some of these stats. Um, let's look at the issue about uh, how we deter wildlife crime. Emma. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. I am wondering what work is being done to deter wildlife crime. Um, I know locally in Castle Douglas, our wildlife crime officer had 30 people in a room teaching them about raptors and persecution. Um, so I'm just wondering what we do to deter wildlife crime and whether the lack of any custodial sentence or lack of action in 23% of the cases contributes to a lack of deterrence. Um, just explain a wee bit about that. Certainly, I mean, in terms of prevention activity, you'll, you'll see by the report there was a significant investment in a, a wildlife crime uh, prevention campaign uh, during that uh, the reporting period, um, which uh, uh, was national. Uh, and again, going back to your original point, Chair, about uh, you know why is there a, an increased public awareness during that period uh, has definitely been raised. Um, in terms of activity uh, around the deterring and prevention, we've got uh, we've had significant um, effort from the wildlife crime officers going into schools doing talks community groups uh, to raise awareness again and, and, and some of the issues. Uh, our wildlife crime coordinator, Andy Maven, Sergeant Andy Maven, uh, he's, done, he's delivered speeches to academia as well around this, uh, this whole issue. Um, we have uh, uh, other the prevention review as well that's ongoing with the Scottish Government, working with them to look how we can take that, uh, take that forward as well. Um, and uh, so that we have our specialist uh, Twitter weeks as well around some of the some areas around uh, bats and badgers and freshwater pearl mussels. So there have been uh, a number of uh, areas where we've made some significant effort to try and raise awareness and try and deter uh, and make the public more conscious of what may or may not be a wildlife crime and encourage that reporting. We have also had some good results in court and we have had some custodial sentences in wildlife crime cases. The Prusty report has looked at sentencing more generally and made some recommendations and I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Sentencing Council have advised that one of the first black letter areas of law that they're going to look at is wildlife crime sentencing guidelines and I think that's a, a positive step as well so we'll see what sort of message that provides to sheriffs and justices in relation to this area. 
at the point, if I can, about uh, I know that sometimes uh, we can fixate on the uh, the structure in terms of dedicated wildlife crime officers, but we have the whole of Police Scotland available to us. And as uh, Mr. Johnson said, there's been training awareness days uh, for for vastly more officers in, in some uh, some of the issues. But also, although it's uh, an issue that's been debated in terms of stop and search uh, for for officers, but you know they are now schooled in some of the powers around wildlife crime that give them the power to stop and search people in certain instances. So again, our frontline officers not just the dedicated wildlife crime officers, but also our, our frontline officers uh, who are uh, delivering on the street and day by day, they are more aware of their powers as well around stop and search for wildlife crimes. Okay. It, looking at the issue about the level of um, conviction rates, I mean, I think we've already touched upon the fact that some of these activities occur in very remote areas and it's very, therefore difficult to gather the evidence. Um, we have organisations like the SGA in Scottish Land and Estates who have openly condemned raptor persecution, for example. But do you get sufficient cooperation from these organisations and their members when it comes to investigating incidents? I mean, I, we, we, through, the, through the Raptor Priority Group and through Paul, um, we have a really positive relationship with all our partners. Um, and uh, so, you know, personally, uh, I have nothing but, uh, you know, positive things to say about uh, our partners in that regard. I've, I, I interact with them in, in my capacity, as do my uh, officers as well. So, uh, so we have we've no issue with that at all. Um, I mean, they, they, the organisations, SLE and SGA, you know, work hard to try and foster that um, uh, or develop that relationship with their own members as well, um, and uh, so you know, I've, I've no issue at all with uh, with that uh, relationship and how we can take it forward. I don't mean so much with the organisations, but I mean on the ground with individual incidents, because I think it suggested in evidence the committee's had that perhaps in some of these settings there is still a, a reluctance to speak out against things like raptor crime for fear of you know threats to jobs, etc. You know, being ostracised in these communities if you did that. What I'm trying to get get to here is what is the police's experience in these circumstances? Are you getting the cooperation on an individual basis that you would hope to get? And I don't think... Uh, yeah, I mean, there may be one or two occasions where there has been a, a reluctance by uh, certain individuals because, uh, and really their personal circumstances, and that's why that is, um, is unclear. Obviously, you know, in terms of our powers and in terms of our ability to enter land, to search, it has to be based on suspicion, has to be based on intelligence. Uh, and uh, unless we have that power, unless we have the evidence or the intelligence to progress an investigation and do that, uh, then, uh, you know, but we do have also uh, voluntary um, uh, you know, so certain individuals do volunteer to help us when they don't have to. So uh, there's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, in personal circumstances as to why someone might be resistant, yeah, there might be one or two occasions, but it really is very, very seldom. The, the other thing, maybe just to finish up this section, is um, you've mentioned PAW. Can I just explore the PAW protocols and how well they are currently working? Because there has been some comment made in relation to some more recent um, incidents that perhaps the PAW protocols aren't being followed in the way they were meant to be. And we'll, could you comment on that? I mean, I think uh, uh, certainly around the, the Raptor Priority Group, which is the I chair, um, the, the, each of the, the individual organisations that sit within that group have their own agendas, have their own priorities, uh, you know, over a whole work very well together. I can't really comment about um, the, the individual motives for uh, perhaps not adhering to a voluntary protocol. Uh, it's been a subject that we've addressed, uh, if you like, uh, and, uh, you know, we're speaking uh, candidly together to make sure that, uh, that we do adhere to the protocols that everyone, for example, within the media protocol uh, has the opportunity to comment on uh, anything that wants to be submitted to the, the press or, or out to the wider public before it does go out so everyone has a chance to comment and perhaps amend uh, the language. But um, So in general, yes, uh, it's positive, but there are one or two instances, Rita, which have been rehearsed in, uh, in the, the press that where it hasn't quite met what it should do and therefore we're encouraging and, and working with partners to, to try and make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah, because as a layman, it strikes me as, as a little bit odd. If I came across uh, an incident of wildlife crime, the first thing I would do is to contact Police Scotland. But it seems to be that that doesn't happen in every instance. And what I'm trying to get to is, to what extent does that hinder you in trying to solve some of these uh, incidents? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that um, uh, you know one or two of uh, our, our partner agencies uh, who can, for example, report directly to the, the Crown Office, um, 
the crimes aren't recorded through Police Scotland. Uh, so, so in effect, that, that sort of recorded data that's on the report doesn't actually reflect potentially actual wildlife crime because some of our partner agencies don't come through Police Scotland. We encourage them to do that. We would far prefer that you know, we are notified and we work with them on every occasion to investigate a wildlife crime. However, you're absolutely right in pointing out the fact that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, and uh, I would encourage those agencies to work with us on every occasion to try and maximise the opportunities for ev evidence gathering because we have the powers, obviously, to progress evidence gathering opportunities that sometimes they don't. Uh, and we would encourage that wholeheartedly. And if I, may, I think that's important on a case by case basis, but when you start to aggregate the data up and, and you look at the, the, what the statistics tell us over the, the period of a year or a number of years, strategically enables us to commit the, the right level of resources to the issues and problems that we have. Now, clearly, if it's not reported to us and it doesn't form part of our metrics and our data bank, quite rightly, managers who are challenged about whether they commit resource A to this issue or that issue we'll be making a decision based on what the demand profile looks like. If we haven't got that information in relation to wildlife crime, there is always the potential that we put a resource in, in, in the right place as, as far as we're concerned, but it turns out to be the wrong place because somebody hasn't shared that. So I'd echo what Sean says, you know, if there are partner agencies out there that have that mechanism direct to the Crown or, or don't report things and pick up the phone and report it to the police, uh, actively encourage them to do that because what we want is the right information. And I go back to that point, right from the first point of call, we can follow it all the way through. So as to whether it ends up as a criminal justice outcome, uh, whether it ends up as an opportunity, you know, not, not just uh, criminal justice as a deterrence, but actually also we want to change behaviours here. And, and yes, criminal justice outcomes will start to change some of the behaviours and does act as a deterrence. But in my experience uh, and working in wildlife crime where I've worked previously, actually getting into that preventative space and getting people to engage in looking after their environment rather than trying to scare them about the criminality is, is far more positive and far more long term. And certainly that's an area of activity that I'm looking at with Police Scotland is to say all of those six areas um, at the moment, you know, there aren't um, three to five year strategies around the prevention intelligence enforcement for each of those six priority areas, um, we seem to be committed to an annual reporting process and an annual this and annual that. Many of these problems are generational. Uh, and my certain drive is to say, well, yes, we can report on an annual basis, but we do need longer term strategic objectives, probably linked to the cycle of schools where we can get into schools at primary age and we can start to track the outcomes in 15 years time when they're young adults and potentially want to engage in hair coursing, want to engage in potential raptor persecution or other sorts of criminality. So at the moment, that's one of the areas that, that I'm going to be looking at addressing is, is around that prevention intelligence enforcement and that longer term piece that would also include why people should report stuff to us. What um, benefit will the having the new wildlife crime unit that's proposed for Scotland? What, what will that do for your ability to to improve the situation? Well, the specifics of um, obviously that was part of the programme for government, uh, and uh, the specifics of um, what that investment may may be. Um, we haven't quite got to the end. We're still obviously speaking to Scottish government about that. But you know, any enhancement of resource is clearly going to be a, an opportunity to improve the service we can provide, uh, uh, whether it be support to divisions or support to specialist officers. Uh, so the very nature of that, we're not quite there at the granular detail yet, but uh, but absolutely, we'll welcome any investment. Be clear. Do you have an opportunity to try and shape what that might look like? Yes, very much so. Yeah, right. we've been in dialogue uh, both with uh, government officials. We had a meeting myself and uh, Mr. Graham prior to Mr. Johnson's uh, uh, taking on the portfolio. Met with the cabinet secretary about that uh, back in September, I think it was, uh, to discuss some of the options. So, uh, but we're not quite at the end game yet. But uh, you know, that, that's ongoing. That's useful. Okay, uh, Mark Russell wants to come in. Thanks, Kavina. I just wanted to go back to your point about evidence, and obviously, you know, we've discussed about the hard evidence uh, and evidence being presented to you, members of the public phoning up. What about the wider scientific evidence, though? I mean, particularly around raptor species. I think the last time ACC Graham was in front of the committee, he indicated that the Police Scotland would be doing a lot more work looking at population modelling, looking at areas where you would expect to have high raptor species uh, population numbers, but actually, you know, they're not there, and that forming part of the context for you focusing your work, looking at areas where persecution may well be happening. Now, you mentioned earlier on, Steve Johnson, about health of populations. So what kind of work are you doing to look at that sort of wider population work? Because clearly that's part of the evidence, isn't it? Absolutely. 
Can, candidly, I, I'm, as probably gadget, I'm just picking up the portfolio. Certainly, the direction of travel, I, I will be taking it, and, and a history of me and my, I've, I've led wildlife crime in other force areas and in other parts of the UK. Uh, that academic piece is absolutely essential because wildlife evolves. You know, I would never have thought that actually one of the most healthy flocks of peregrine falcons would be found in, in London. Um, it, it evolves and it changes, and I need to understand that. And my officers need to understand that because we, we, it helps us inform our strategic objectives around that prevention, intelligence, enforcement. So certainly, you know, one of the commitments I can make here is that during my tenure now, I will look at what the academic research says, where wildlife crime is evolving, and certainly make sure that we feed that into the narrative of the report because it's really, really important. Um, where we're having positive impact, I would like that to be backed up by the academic evidence to, to, to support that assertion. Where there is um, a lack of activity or where there is a, an academic uh, statement that says we're not quite getting it right, that's not part of an evolutionary process. It's actually linked to criminality. I want to understand that. I want to be able to commit the resources to it. I want to engage with partners. So in the first instance, uh, the most cost-effective way for me in Police Scotland is to prevent it from happening in the first place. So across all of the sort of six priority areas, I, I see the evidence from academia and those bodies that do monitor the health of the species within those areas um, is absolutely essential to me. It, it is, in common parlance, about being intelligence-led, and a lot of that evidence will sit within academia. So I certainly would welcome any support from academia in that. I can't commit financial resource to doing that, but certainly can engage on a partnership basis of trying to improve the position. That is a strong part of the evidence. Oh, absolutely it is, isn't it? I, I can sit here and, and anecdotally people will say to me uh, the numbers of golden eagles in Scotland has, has never been healthier and it's growing and, it, and it's growing every day. Fact or fiction? It, is that right? Where's the evidence to suggest that is right? You know, we're certainly seeing less cases and certainly we're anecdotally hearing communities talking more positively about uh, the flora and fauna of Scotland. People talk about it in economic terms, but they also talk in, in moral terms. They use a language around, it's right that we protect these sort of things. Where is the academic evidence that I can put my hand on and say there's a piece of research by X university or X body that says the health of uh, the golden eagle population in Scotland has gone from this at this point to this at this point, and that's a positive correlation or negative. Uh, and I'd certainly welcome... Um, any, any work with any academic bodies or interest groups that can actually provide that sound evidential basis. But it has to be sound. This, this cannot be somebody going out um, and purporting to have some academic rigour around research. Um, for, it to be, for me to be intelligence-led, the actual research itself has to have academic rigour. It has to stand scrutiny. Uh, and certainly, I would want that then to drive operational activity from a policing perspective but more importantly, a multi-agency perspective. So actually, uh, wildlife crime isn't just spoken about in criminal justice terms, it's talked about in education environment. It's talked about in terms of health, you know, getting out and enjoying the flora and fauna. Actually, that's an opportunity to put eyes and ears out there, et cetera, et cetera. It's much more strategic, and we need to play our role in that, but we are but one small part. Appreciate that point. I think the challenge, though, is that that commitment was given in this parliament last year by your predecessor. And what I'm asking you is about what actions taken over the last year. It's clearly not reported in the report. It's clearly you've admitted yourself this morning it's an important part of the evidence base. And you've made another commitment one year on, on behalf of Police Scotland, that once again you'll be working with the evidence. So what, so, I mean, what's for changed example, in the last year? Sorry, sorry to talk across you. Uh, I think, you know, through, for example, the Raptor Priority Group, we have uh, our partners there that are you know, doing a lot of scientific research, a lot of academic research as well, into, for example, uh, the work around the Heads Up for Harriers. There's the Golden Eagle Relocation uh, uh, Project, which is going to start in the borders very soon, which I think our partners might talk about uh, in later submissions today. Um, and uh, that's a hugely positive piece of work that we're working to prevent then uh, or raise awareness of that, uh, that project as well. The annual bird uh, prey crime maps as well, which is obviously providing the hot spots of activity um, uh, around potential raptor uh, crime. That's a positive step because it allows us to analyse, allows us to work with our partners to take that forward to say, well, do we need to, what kind of resource do we need to, uh, to, 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 to commit to doing the, the right work around that particular area? So it's incremental. You're right saying that if, if there's been a, a, a specific piece of work that has led to uh, a specific outcome, no, not at the moment, but it is incremental and we are working hard to try and use academic, academia and use scientific research and our analysis of uh, raptor incidents, for example, to then take ourselves forward with, with our partners. 
OK, let's move this on. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Right. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning to you all. Uh, could we turn to um, the persecution of badgers, which, as um, everyone knows, but just for the record, are protected um, as a species by law in Scotland? And uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, dig a bit deeper into uh, the reasons for badger crime not being reported to the Crown Office and how this might be improved upon. Um, uh, and uh, written evidence from Scottish badgers highlights um, what they see as weaknesses in um, both your, um, your services in the approach to badger crime. And I wonder if you're able to comment on those just very briefly. One, one or two of them are that police call centres don't necessarily recognise badger crime as a crime and that there can be delays in investigations, which would obviously mean that evidence um, deteriorated. And also, it's not necessarily progressed um, after um, lengthy delays. And there might be, because of that, a lack of transparency. And there is actually a table that um, I don't know if you've had sight of, but um, Scottish badgers in, the, um, in evidence have highlighted that um, for instance, in 2014-15, badger crime reported by Police Scotland was was some um, five cases. Badger crime reported um, to the Crown Pros uh, Prosecution Service was four, and badger crime identified um, by Scottish badgers was um, 42. Now that's a, an enormous um, difference. So. Um, having listened carefully to the ev evidence you've already given this morning about um, the difficulties of, of, of finding evidence um, and taking that point on board, I think um, I would still appreciate comment on what you can do to improve on that or indeed whether those um, uh, criticisms are valid. Well, thank you for the, the opportunity to do that. Uh, I think there's a couple of things I can highlight to you. Uh, firstly, a, a really positive step. We now have a, a secure uh, intelligence provision mechanism between Scottish badger, uh, badgers and ourselves uh, for providing us with intelligence uh, to help us uh, in the investigation uh, of, uh, of badger crime. So that's been recently set up, so a, a secure email line for that, which, is, uh, which will be really positive. Uh, in terms of understanding of badger crime, our uh, call handlers and our, our call centres uh, have specific training around all the wildlife crime priorities, so they're aware of uh, some of the key um, uh, aspects, if you like, of badger crime. So when a member of the public phones in uh, to report what they believe to be suspicious activity around badgers, then there's that information available to call handlers. Uh, there's all the, uh, the, the, um, the material and training material for first responders uh, that's available both online in terms of uh, hard copy booklets around badger crime when they, they do attend these incidents. I made the point earlier on about about um, the fact that uh, you know we can receive a report that uh, uh, people are walking dogs in the area of woods where there's believed to be a badger set, that can then end up not being a crime because there is no disturbance of a set once we investigate. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of the actual criteria for. Uh, uh, proving a crime and presenting the evidence to the Crown Office, there needs to be that uh, evidence of the live set disturbance, uh, you know, fairly contemporaneously. So there are a number of challenges there, but we do have the mechanisms for informing our call handlers, informing our first responders, and that sharing of information now uh, directly between Scottish Badgers and ourselves, which will, will help us take things forward. So, I mean, I would really seek reassurance on this point in, in view of the fact that there are 42, um, uh, as the, the information that I highlighted, uh, 42 crimes identified by Scottish badgers. And, and, I, and um, I would say with respect that I would doubt that those would be two people going to walk their dog and, and, and then walking out of the woods again. Uh, so I, I, I would like some sort of um, response on, on that. In terms of uh, the, the, the evidence around, so the crimes that are reported by Scottish badgers, are you talking about that they've reported directly to the Crown Office or to Police Scotland? They've been identified as Identified. So, yeah. so whether it is a crime or not, that needs to be assessed yes, by the investigators absolutely. and obviously yeah. then that evidence provided to the Crown yeah. Office. So in terms of breaking that down, uh, I would I'll give you that reassurance and every single one will be assessed on its own merits and will rep be reported accordingly based on the evidence and based on the, uh, the material we have at our disposal. Um, I don't know if Gary wants to make any comment about you know, the reports around badgers. But... Well, the 
only the police and occasionally the SSPCA report badger offences to the Crown. We will look at every case individually and where there's sufficient evidence some form of prosecutorial action is very, very likely because this is a high priority area. But we need the reports to come to us. That figure of 42, there weren't 42 cases sent to us by anybody. We can only assess what comes to us. And the identification of an incident as a crime doesn't necessarily mean that there would be sufficient evidence to prosecute that case in court. It may be clear that a crime has occurred, but the identity of the perpetrator may not be known. There may not necessarily be sufficient corroborated evidence to prove it. We work with what comes in to us. And it also comes back to the difficulties that we have, we all have, in interpreting the statistics because our systems were set up as case management systems, not statistical gathering systems. So a case involving a badger may not necessarily be defined as a badger case, would have to be under the protection of badgers. If it's snaring, it'll come under a different category. I'm pleased that it was mentioned earlier that the figures in the report are becoming more usable year on year. I think there is still work we can all do to improve that clarity and transparency. And it may well be that in the fullness of time, technology and other matters overtake that. The Lord President is looking at modernization of the whole criminal justice system. And one of his main wishes is for what's described as an evidence vault, which in effect would be a single computer system for the whole criminal justice service. If we ever get to that point, we'll finally be in a position for wildlife crime and everything else of being able to compare apples and apples and track exactly the same thing all the way through without this constant difficulty that we count cases, other people count individuals, some agencies count charges. So it it's not as clear as I would like it to be. I hope we're moving in the right direction and breaking things down and we'll learn for the future. And I think the reports as they build up year on year will be a more useful comparison against each other. If, if, if I could, uh, just as an additional part of that, you know, we, uh, through our, our very positive relationship with Gary's unit, you know, we'll discuss individual cases. Uh, you know, what have we got evidentially and we'll discuss whether or not there's a sufficient to report and as Gary said it doesn't necessarily mean that ultimately that will go to trial and a, and a conviction but on a, an individual case basis we'll discuss that uh, and if there's not enough to report then obviously we can't report it uh, but you know have that assurance that you know each is, is assessed in its own merit and moving forward as well we have a training um, program coming up next year this this coming year with Scottish Badgers for ourselves and our Crown Office colleagues to again enhance understanding of, of the whole issues and uh, so across each of our agencies, so that's coming up in the near future too. But, but before I'll... Thank you, Convener. This is um, the issue that you um, raise about uh, if, if a crime is recorded in, for, for not necessarily in, in relation to wildlife crime, but for another reason, such as the use of a gun or, or without a licence or whatever it may be. This has come up for Rural Affairs Committee, and I think that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Convener, but I think it was like not only last year, but the year before as well. And we're being, it's being suggested there are going to be improvements in this, and it's encouraging to hear you say that that is going to happen, but uh, can you give us any sort of sense of, of, because that can't be that difficult in terms of data to say, well, the person was only prosecuted for this, but it was all, or is it indeed also a wildlife crime? Can you just explain a little bit more about that? Before you do that can I just yeah. pick up on something? The Scottish Badger submission states, and I quote, Badgers are also regularly sub subjected to deliberate persecution, such as poisoning, gassing, drowning with slurry, suffocation where sets are blocked, and crushing when sets are destroyed. If they're not exaggerating that, the scale of that, then you must have evidence in some of these cases, surely. But I have to have the cases. We've had four reported to us. The okay. volume that they're talking about is not what is reaching our desks. Anything that does come to us, we will look at very carefully. And badgers are a key priority and are certainly subject to 
grossly inhuman treatment by some individuals, both f through their uh, idiotic idea of sport and for other reasons. And that is something that we would like to be able to take seriously. We, we need the building blocks to do it. If I may come back to your point, the, it does sound as though it should be very simple to extrapolate this information, but we receive tens of thousands of cases a year. Our computer system was designed and built to manage the throughput of those cases, not to be able to identify them in particularly great detail. We're getting better as time goes on. But to extract the sort of information that would be useful would in fact probably require a complete new system, which has significant capital costs for a statistical purpose, which is very useful, but not the core thing that we are there to do. Our system is perfectly fit for purpose for prosecuting crime. It's just not always quite as helpful as we might like it to be in some of the other areas that are interesting to us. The timescale for modernising the entire system, I'm not in a position to comment on. I know there's work being done led by Scottish Court Service, and I think that's a very positive thing. We'll see where that takes us. That would have huge benefits right across the Criminal Justice Service. Uh, and just lastly, um, sorry, through the convener, if, yeah. Is it right if... Um, of course, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Clearly there's some work to do, isn't there? You know, the reality is if, if uh, Scottish badges believe that in, in that year there were 42 offences committed and we've only crimed four, uh, there's a lot of work to do. Certainly the commitment will be. You know, Scottish badges, as, as Sean has already said, there's, there's, there's a developing relationship involved in training, involved in that. But there's clearly a piece of work to do on deconfliction and understanding the terminology. Because is that 42 incidents? Were those 42 incidents reported to Police Scotland? Could I track that from the incident through to us not criming it because we didn't believe it was a crime? Are we defining a crime in exactly the same way that would be recognised by the Crown and recognised by the investigators on the ground? And certainly my commitment is to work with Scottish Badgers and any other agency out there that believes we need to deconflict the data to make sure that when we appear in front of you, if Scottish Badgers put something in front of it, at least we as a partnership can recognise that. We have a compelling narrative around why there would be a difference, because there might well be, between an, an agency that records to a nationally agreed standard and, and an organisation which is, a, if you like, a single interest around a particular species. There will always be some difference there, but certainly not in the magnitude of four recorded crimes to 42, as purported in this report. So there's, there's, a, there's a commitment there to start to deconflict that work in partnership with Scottish Badgers to understand, you know, do we have a recording mechanism where on a regular basis we can deconflict that data to say you have reported it to us and you've done nothing or we did report it to you and we were satisfied with the outcome because at the moment I, I have nothing to suggest that that takes place but certainly I know from speaking to Andy um, we have a commitment to making sure that we can work with Scottish Badgers to deconflict that information for the future. I, think, I mean, while that's reassuring Mr Johnson, I think that um, what Chief Superintendent, should I say, um, that it, it's, it's still concerning that um, around clarity of definitions, which you've, you've hinted at, that are people in, in the organisations and the, and the public and yourselves and, you know, really understanding each other in terms of the definitions. Obviously, poor is, poor is going to help with that, but um, I don't want to spend far, you know, too long on badges, but when um, uh, the organisation comes before us in the second panel, there are also some discrepancies in relation to Scottish Government figures that were given to me in a parliamentary question and, and, the, and what is said in this report as well. So I think uh, anything, uh, if you're able to stay or, or to look at the official report, rather than ask those questions now, I think it would be helpful if Scottish badge, badges could um, put forward that evidence and then perhaps you could comment to the committee in writing on it because in terms of tra transparency these things are really really important to reassure uh, everybody in Scotland. I think that's a very good point because we, we have you in front of us annually to look at the content of the report but there is nothing to stop you and I would encourage you to write to the committee in between time with updates on how you're progressing your relationships with organisations like Scottish Badgers etc because I think this is a really important issue. Uh, Finlay Carson. 
I think most of the points have been covered actually since uh, I indicated a question. I'm just concerned. We seem to be getting tied up in the in the, in the lack of IT. You know, we're talking about five Badger crimes recorded by the police and 42 by Badger Scotland. I don't think we need a computer system to actually dig into that, but I think Mr Johnson actually suggested that you're looking at other reasons why there's a discrepancy. I don't, I don't think we should be getting tied up in failures or lack of IT systems with the numbers we're talking about regarding Badgers. So it's an additional reassurance to the committee. I mean, I, you know, through the through the wildlife crime liaison officer structure, through our single points of contact as well within criminal investigation, I line manage all the detective supers and the, the 13 policing divisions. Uh, they are acutely aware of uh, the, the the requirement for rigorous investigation into all wildlife crime. Uh, you know, they they uh, very often take specific uh, intervention and in investigations, appointing detective officers as opposed to wildlife crime or or, or, or PC. So every single crime. Uh, uh, I, I have confidence that we, we give it uh, as much uh, uh, rigour as possible based on the circumstances presented to us and their understanding of what's been presented, uh, and then we have that engagement with the Crown. So, uh, I mean, there are some technicalities around badgers, about live sets, whether they're active, and uh, which you know the experts will tell you about uh, probably later on. But we are more than welcome, we would more than welcome additional knowledge or additional ways that we can progress, uh, you know, uh, and even improve service around that particular criminality. So. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, let's move from badgers to bats. Morris Golden. Thank you, convener. Uh, bat persecution is considered to be a wildlife crime priority. We had three offences recorded in 2013-14 and none in 14-15. And proceedings in relation to those offences are categorised or appears in the other wildlife offences. I wonder if you could update the committee on what work has been done to improve reporting as well as conviction rates in this area and what, if any, you perceive as the key barriers to this? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh seldom reported uh, bad disturbance uh, unfortunately or fortunately I mean you know whether it's uh, uh, you know how, how wide scale the problem is uh, is, is obviously unclear just now um, and uh, you know sometimes uh, the reports we get around uh, bats uh, are occasionally we have instances where you know people are upset about tree cutting nearby and they'll say that there's a bat and they'll actually go along there's not a bat colony there uh, uh, you know that, that does happen uh, and, and quite often you know the tree cutting that's done by local authorities is subject to eco ecological survey, and uh, but it is seldom reported. So we do have difficulties uh, around that, and we would obviously welcome further uh, further reporting on that. Um, again, moving forward, we have bat training uh, coming up uh, in the early in this year uh, to again to enhance our relationship with those experts in bat uh, uh, understanding and our own our own people as well as the crown officer are coming along to that as well. So um, it is an, an unclear environment, I have to say. I mean, developers. Uh, you know, private developers and local authority are aware of their um, uh, requirements, uh, legal requirements around uh, bat colonies, uh, and we do. It was part of the crime prevention during this reporting period as well uh, to, to enhance that awareness, and uh, we'll keep pursuing that. But again, you're right; we don't get a lot of reports about bats, and uh, we would welcome more. Uh, in terms of the the three offences. Uh, I, I don't know if you'll know now, but happy to take in writing later. Obviously, they've been reported. Do you know where they are in the system at all? No, okay. I can provide that in writing to the committee in due course, if that would help. What sort of penalties are imposed for this sort of crime? The same general penalties you would get for, for any sort of wildlife crime. Bat crime is quite rarely prosecuted. It would depend, I suspect, very much on the nature of what the disturbance had been, if there was an indication that it was for commercial gain, for instance, in the course of some form of development, I would hope and anticipate that a court would take a fairly dim view of that. Uh, but it's not something I can comment on categorically. The other thing I would say is that, as has already been mentioned, it's very rarely reported, and that comes back to the issues that we've spoken about elsewhere, about encouraging members of the public to report what they perceive as wildlife crime, whether it turns out to be or not. But the more information that's provided to Police Scotland, the better a picture we can get. And the 
more chance of picking up offences that have occurred. And that comes back to areas well out with my sphere of competence. It is about education and early engagement. I've certainly been on a, a bat walk in my locality and it is amazing to see them flying about at night and to understand that there are these species living almost literally next door to you. But it's to get that message out and it's schools and youth clubs and so on that are the place for engaging there. But I think it's we need to encourage reporting and then we can start looking at the mechanisms. Yeah, so I forgot to mention we had our, our Twitter week uh, for uh, bat awareness and back in October. Uh, so again, we're you know we're trying to use the social media tools to get that awareness out there as well. So we are trying our best. Do you think? And I'll let you come in, uh, uh, Assistant Chief Constable. But um, how key do you think public awareness is? I mean, just from your own reflections, and I'll, I'll ask the, the subsequent panel as well. Um, you know, my take would be that perhaps people don't recognise it as uh, an incident to report in relation to bats. And you know, how do you think that would help in terms of the reporting aspect? I think I think it can help massively. I think you know, getting as much public information out there. You know, I think we've already answered the question around that preventative piece, getting the knowledge out there around the types and scale of the offences. And it's probably not for Police Scotland to answer this one, but certainly perhaps point the panel in the direction of local authorities and planning. Uh, they will actually need to keep records where they've developed uh, a site, where they've looked at infrastructure development, where they've looked at new build or land management proposals, and there are colonies present. They will cease and they will pause and they will record that. that that's an interesting uh, contextual basis because in the past, I can certainly say crimes that would have been reported to the police around somebody developing a new site would be well, there were bats there, We've, nine times out of ten, we would get called at the end once the persecution has taken place and the colony ceases to exist. I think local authorities and the planning are very, very good at this now around getting people in to do the early surveys around that impact on uh, wildlife. Once they spot whether there are colonies there, they do the appropriate measures and, and put the appropriate measures in place uh, to manage that. So certainly it goes back to the point around the contextual information that's out there. Police Scotland won't hold that data, but certainly I would imagine the local authorities would. And that would be a, re a really interesting backdrop because I, I would imagine those numbers will increase, certainly as people look to develop in those spaces inhabited by colonies. Uh, and, and I certainly would, would find that beneficial to know that actually um, we are getting the message out there. People do understand uh, the, the issues in relation to bat colonies, particularly those who are developers and those that would seek to develop. But the local authorities, I think, have good systems and mechanisms in place. Now, I say that, I think the evidence should come from the local authorities as, as to whether they do have those mechanisms in place and that they take their duties and responsibilities around protection of wildlife seriously. Finna Carson. Sorry, I'm also sure under the, the government's prevention review, which is obviously part of the programme for government, you know, one of the six priority areas, this will be included in that, how we, we develop that going forward, and that's part of our ongoing dialogue. So. Uh, Finlay Carson. Yeah, I'd be this is a, the lazier bat champion for the parliament, but uh, which doesn't tend to roost in houses, so that's, uh, that's a relief. But how, how you know you've talked about local authorities, but uh, do the local authorities police any, any of it? You know, when they go in to look at barn conversions or whatever, do they go back to check that if there have been uh, bat populations, uh, that do they tend to police it, or do they engage with uh, the police when they think there's uh, been any contravening of the planning? Uh, Laws or specifically aware of a local authority coming to us and telling us about a, a bat colony disturbance personally, but I can certainly find out. Um, but uh, but they, 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 they know that that's their uh, obligation, if you, if you like, but uh, I don't specify, I, I can find out for you. It would certainly be, it would appear more realistic that it would be the, the local authorities that would come forward rather than general public, uh, because it'll be barn conversions and things like that that are actually more likely to disturb the populations. Thanks. OK, let's move on. Uh, Alexander Burnett. Thank you. Um, as species champion for the freshwater pearl mussel, I'm very glad to see uh, that it's a uh, priority area uh, for it. And, and um, yeah, I think whilst uh, the, the size of it, you know, the, s the smallest of the, the areas covered, yeah, is completely disproportionate uh, to the serious threat it, it is under. And you know, its rarity and scarcity is, is, is part of its problem. Um, I know 
with the statistics reported and, and the, uh, some of the detail reported, there's a lot of issues around that and you have to redact a lot of information uh, because of its rarity and its locations and that might encourage more crime in those areas. Uh, I just wonder, could you speak a little bit around uh, what is a very, very niche uh, subject and, and where we're going with uh, detecting crime and prosecutions, uh, uh, but also in this particular case, um, in this particular area, it's uh, in some of the other areas, it's easier to see the motivation uh, whilst wildlife crime uh, uh, happens uh, with with a pearl mussel. Uh, could you maybe speak a bit about the motivation? We're not, I'm not, I haven't learned of any uh, secondary market in in these pearls. And, you know, where, where does this, where, where is it all coming from? Perhaps start, and then I'll hand over to Sean. Um, whether it's of benefit to the panel, I, I came from a place in England where they had probably the only other colony of uh, freshwater pearl mussels, and certainly um, worked with industry. Uh, one of the issues there, uh, and one of the main threats to freshwater pearl mussels, as, as far as I understand as a layperson, is, is, is around depth of water and the quality of the water. Uh, and certainly working with those companies that extract water from the rivers uh, and places where those uh, species exist is, is a persistent challenge about making sure that the depth of the water is absolutely right for the species to survive. Uh, certainly, I think um, protecting those sites um, is, is really, really important. Uh, the mechanism for reporting the activity, though, I think should be clear and that, that there should be mechanisms of reporting to the panel in confidence around that in terms of making sure that uh, you have the confidence that it's not just uh, on the list and we're hiding behind a veil of we can't share that with you, we can't share that with you. Uh, so so I'll, I'll certainly be pushing from my perspective and the relationship I've had with previous uh, sort of panels is that we can give those assurances uh, and we do that in a confidential manner, uh, not necessarily a public manner. As you rightly point out, I mean, sometimes the discoveries of uh, disturbance uh, can be many months after they actually happen. And, uh, you know, we've got one joint investigation with SEPA ongoing in the Tayside area at the moment. And uh, we obviously continue to work closely with them wherever they can. Uh, we had our, uh, again, using uh, Twitter, our awareness week back in November. Um, and again, it's, it's about trying to identify through the retail trade where these pearls might be going. So that is work, on, uh, work that's currently ongoing. But uh, there, there are challenges around it. We've published the heat maps as well, as you as probably aware and uh, we'll continue to work closely as much as we can with our partners but it's quite any success with tracking where it is going the market <clears throat> uh, not at the moment um, but uh, I can certainly find out and uh, report back uh, but uh, yeah let's work on going so you can tell me that okay thanks let's move on uh, Jenny Goldruth uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I appreciate there are issues in terms of comparing prosecution rates uh, as the prosecution might occur in a different year from which the crime uh, happened in itself. And there's also clearly uh, issues with regards to recording and reporting between Police Scotland, as you've alluded to, and uh, the Procurator Fiscal when partners go to different agencies, um, which may obviously affect uh, the level of recording and what we see in front of us today. But I'd just like to ask, can an estimation be made um, about the numbers of wildlife crime not recorded by Police Scotland, do you think? And secondly, why has there been a 12% increase in relevant crime reported uh, to the Procurator Fiscal, but a 29% drop in terms of those prosecuted? Right, so uh, just, to, uh, just to clarify, could you just repeat that, that last part then? Uh, the Please. second question or the first question? Ah, uh, yeah. So the first question was, can you make an estimation with regards to uh, the estimated number of crimes not recorded by Police Scotland? Uh, no, <laughs> to be quite <laughs> frank. Uh, I suppose the, 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 the unknown quantity of, uh, of crime uh, out there, it's a bit like any, any particular crime area, the dark figure of crime, as we sometimes call it. I mean, people refer to reported crime as the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it may well be the case, but, uh, you know, so we, we can only investigate what we know about. Uh, and, uh, but in terms of an estimation of what might be out there that we don't know about or the unknowns, uh, no, I don't have a figure for you, uh, I'm mm -hmm. afraid to say. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's not the answer you're looking for. But uh, And in terms of getting a higher uh, recorded or reporting rate, what kind of things do you think? I think Emma actually asked about this previously. Um, but do you think that there are more things that could be done in terms of uh, public outreach? Or um, Steve Johnson, you spoke about education, which I think is really important. Um, what do you see as key in terms of increasing um, the re reporting of wildlife crime more generally? Candidly, you know, can I, can I put an estimate on an actual figure? No. Mm -hmm. Can I make a broad sweeping statement that is, is somebody more likely to report a crime against themselves, a colleague, or theft? Uh, yeah, I, I think they probably are, than, than they are likely to report a wildlife crime. Some of that will be lack of knowledge that actually what they're seeing is a crime. That's the education piece. Some of it, complete ambivalence. 
as to whether something is persecuted in that, and that, and that's, that just exists within society, as, as, as abhorrent as we would find that. Uh, and there'll be those that, that do commit those crimes that just wouldn't report them anyway. So I think there's that broad gambit. So, you know, I, I couldn't pin uh, my colours to a mass that there's a specific number there, but I would certainly suggest that uh, I'd be a fool if I sat here and said that all wildlife crime is reported to Police Scotland. It certainly isn't the case, as, as it isn't with, with many other types of crime. Um, so what we've got to do is make sure that we do get in that space. One, to inform those people that do want to protect the flora and fauna and, and use... Uh, the legislation appropriately to create an environment where they want to live and want to prosper. Uh, we ha absolutely have to do that, so we, we do need to engage in that space. Uh, and part of that is about making people step forward and report those crimes that see them. Uh, and it probably goes hand in glove with what I've said before about that academia, insofar as uh, there's a presumption around that, that actually the crime is taking place and things haven't moved on. Uh, we need to understand that. Um, in relation to fish poaching, 50% of the crimes that are reported to the Crown Office are actually being prosecuted. Is that because the, the evidential base that you're getting is more robust than it is in some other areas of wildlife crime? The reality is that fish poaching cages are often more straightforward. They are likely to fall into a more traditional evidential set. If you're lucky, two people will have seen the crime being committed or seen enough evidence to prove that the crime has been committed and that's just the reality of it you're much less likely to have that simple straightforward evidential set for raptor persecution or sometimes you get it for badger set disturbance but fish poaching is much more likely that you catch somebody red-handed okay that's fine and on the subject of raptor persecution let's move on to that mark roscoe um, you've spoken quite a bit this morning about public confidence, public awareness, um, and obviously the report is very useful in terms of identifying where persecution has happened in the past, where it's likely possibly to happen in the future as well, and the overall trend. But and given that context, why are there five incidents of raptor persecution where information has been withheld and therefore don't form part of the official statistics? Information has been withheld in the in the report about individual raptor persecution incidents. Uh, the reason for that withholding of information from Police Scotland from the government, in terms of why it's not in the report, why it's not detailed in the report. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't know, and I can find out for you. Right. Okay. I mean, let me give you an example. I mean, there's four particular incidents, for example, that are. Uh, detailed in the RSPB's report, Legal Killing of Birds of Prey in Scotland, 2014 review. Um, they, they identify, for example, four incidents that took place on an estate uh, near Heriot. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence in here, uh, and yet that, that information is not in the 2014 report. These were crimes that took place in 2014, are recorded in the RSPB data, but aren't then recorded in the wildlife crime report, so they don't form part of your data. Now, I, I don't know why there's a mismatch between one set of information that's in the public domain, and yet it's not recorded in your official wildlife crime report for that year. So, so it's, uh, there's five instances uh, re um, recorded by RSPB that don't form our recorded statistics. That's, that's what you're referring to? No, I'm saying there are, there are four incidences that RSPB report right which do not form part of your wildlife crime report, you're, you're withholding the data on that. And I'm trying to, trying to understand why you're withholding the data about the location of these crimes. I mean, I, the, the only thing I can offer is that um, if it's not, if it's, if it's deemed to be a crime uh, by a partner agency, and uh, it's maybe not a crime in terms of the, the classic recording requirements, uh, I, uh, but I can, I'll, I'll need to find out for you. I don't know the, the answer to that one, that, those particular I, just, I do want to push you on this because, you know, the, these four incidences were involved um, baited traps, I and mean, there's even a picture here. Yeah, that's a baited trap with a pigeon. The spring traps here. That's illegal, isn't it? That's I illegal. can't see from this distance, but if that's it's an illegal well, trap, it's an illegal it, trap. It is yeah. illegal. So. What I'm trying to get to is why that clear illegality is not reported in the wildlife crime report in terms of the location of it and also the fact that this took place. 
Because if you're trying to build public confidence that you're tackling wildlife crime and you're trying to give a true picture of wildlife crime to the general public and also alert people to the fact that this crime's taken place near Harriet, then, you know, if you want the public on your side, you need to disclose all the data unless there's some other reason for why you're withholding that in terms of it being an ongoing investigation or something. So I'm, I'm trying to understand that. And those have definitely been reported to the police? Uh, well, in, in one case, I think it was the, the ratio of state where SNH withdrew the general licence. Uh, they put a restriction order on, on the estate. So I, I'm amazed that the police didn't know that. Well, the, with, no, the with, withdrawing of a, um, a general licence uh, can be based on intelligence only. Uh, so it's not necessarily a, a recorded crime that's been reported. Uh, you know, the, the restrictions on licences and that, that piece of work can sometimes be based on just intelligence only over a period of time, which is enough for SNH to, to obviously suspend that general licence. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's a crime. So you need a bit of clarity around that. So that, that could explain that part of it. Uh, so it's not necessarily a recorded crime. I think it would be useful, Convener, if we could get some more background to that. I mean, this is a report from the RSPB that is in the public domain. You know, I, I just picked one up off, off a stall at a, at, a, at a fair. You know, I'm a member of the public. I'm interested. Oh, yeah, I'm going for a walk near Harriet. Oh, gosh, there's some, you know, wildlife crime taking place. I've got that information. I know that from this report that's in the public domain. And yet it's not reported in your, in your annual um, reports. If, if we're told, if we're told about here is whether it's crime or alleged crime. Can I just suggest that, just in case? Uh, Steve Johnson. I think, you know, we'd certainly uh, take up the offer, I think, of meeting out, out with this committee meeting and then uh, to, to perhaps fully understand the question that's being asked of us, and then we'll provide a written response to yourself and the whole committee. I think I'll be... Sorry, okay. just Morris Golden wants to come in. Hi, just, uh, just a clarification, perhaps more generally, but following up from Mark Ruskell's point, can I just... Um, I think it would be helpful for the committee to get on the record... Uh, presumably, if you get a, an incident reported to you, then you investigate it, uh, decide whether it's been a, a crime, then, if appropriate, refer it, at which point, then, it, if there's enough evidence, then you would um, uh, decide to prosecute or not as appropriate with any other crime. Um, and, therefore, uh, if another agency um, produces a report um, whether it's in the public domain or not, then unless that has been reported to you and gone through a, an, an official channel in some way, then, then you're not in a position to um, would deal with it other than through your rigorous processes. I mean, the, 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 the ethical recording of crime, uh, an incident's reported that has a, a closure code, it's either a no crime or it's a crime, and every single one is assessed uh, and it will be closed off otherwise, and that then leads to an investigation, a crime report, and uh, that, that rigour that... So, unless we're told about it, if we're told about it, it will be recorded as a crime if it meets a crime criteria. And if a, if a member of the public thinks it's a crime uh, and uh, we investigate it and it looks like it, it will be recorded as a crime, it can then be no crime. Uh, once investigation takes place and the evidence it doesn't meet that criteria, but ethically it will be recorded a crime until it's no crime. So, uh, and HMICS's recent uh, uh, audit of us, the biannual audit of our crime recording, had us as good, uh, and that the ethical recording of crime is is uh, improving all the time. So, Mark Roscoe. Yeah, just come back to a further question. I mean, what percentage of raptor persecution crimes are referred to the procurator fiscal? And then what is the conviction rate on the back of that? How many are referred to the fiscal? What percentage of raptor persecution crimes are referred to the procurator fiscal? And what is the conviction rate? Well, OK, the actual stat, if it's not in the, the report there, I haven't, I'm not going to the, the, the specific tables there, if a raptor crime is recorded as a crime and it's investigated, it will be reported and it will be in the... If it's not a crime... Uh, or there's not enough uh, to, to report it, it won't be reported. So I'm, I'm, not, quite, uh, I'm not quite getting where you're, you're coming from in that sense. What, what, what's, the, what's the percentage of crimes that are then referred to the Procurator Fiscal? Yeah, no, no that's no, right. You don't have and that. No. Can, can, we can provide that to you. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, why has there been a 19% increase in offences this year in terms of raptor persecution? A point I made uh, earlier on, where we've seen increases of where we have the full-time wildlife crime officers, particularly in the north 
uh, of the country, so the six officers uh, predominantly there. It, it comes back to understanding the data and being able to follow the story. Uh, I think there is something in where we do have those full-time members that people have access to. I think it's referred to in one of the reports that the ability and proximate to the reporting to the resource being deployed uh, is, is a positive correlation in terms of uh, conviction and certainly in relation to progression of the matter. I think that that is key. So, so it's certainly one of the areas I, I've looked at and certainly will pick up on in terms of whether there is a positive correlation because it does, it does look that way statistically, but actually we'd need to work with partners to see whether that is the case. But I, but I do think it, statistically there is a correlation between where we have full-time wildlife crime officers uh, and positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. And certainly the increase in the reporting. I think it's because if you've got somebody there that you know and you can report stuff to and it's a, it's a relationship that's built, quite evidently that's going to be, um, more is going to happen through that route. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the very nature of Do you think persecution is going up or down? Uh, statistically, I, I, I can't give you an out of that. The, the statistics would say yes it is, but actually it goes back to the point of uh, are there more or are there being more reported? Uh, statistically it would say there is more being reported. You could make that parallel assumption. But is, is there also a, a potential here that there's a change in behaviour behind raptor persecution? That in the past, perhaps naively, people were poisoning raptors and weaving the evidence for you to find. Is it now the case that birds are disappearing, um, not being found? Um, one might explain some of that to an, ex to an extent, at least, uh, beyond satellite tag failing. That may be part of it. But are we seeing a change in the nature of raptor persecution where the evidence is being disposed of? Difficult to say. I mean, uh, you know, there's, uh, there could be any number of reasons for the disappearance uh, of birds. Uh, you know, the current state of health of uh, you know, certain birds of prey, um, as Mr Johnson said earlier on, it's, uh, it'd be good that uh, sort of qualitative outcome of our partners' work around that would be good to know. Uh, uh, and, you know, we, we do know in, in certain areas that uh, there are uh, uh, conservation-wise improvements in, for example, golden eagle uh, pairs nesting. But uh, in terms of the, the change in persecution, uh, and you made, you, made uh, you alluded to the, the satellite tagging uh, element and the, the recent review of, of satellite tagging that uh, the Cabinet Secretary has ordered. That will be a useful piece of work as well uh, when we get to the end of that about you know, informing us about certain aspects of uh, raptor persecution, but um, it's difficult to say just now. Um, but, but when an area of the country, a part of the country, is devoid of raptors, it does make one wonder why that's the case. I must make Police Scotland wonder why that's the case. It was reported to us, and I think we got reports that actually there was a there was a, a, a flock, or there were nesting pairs in a certain location, and they're no longer there. That's the point of having the wildlife crime liaison officers that actually we can we can start to get to the bottom of that. Uh, I, th I think the point around whether um, I think the point that you made was that somebody would be removing the evidence before we got there. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is a, is a negative outlook. I would also say that there, there's some positive relationships coming uh, in terms of. Um, or, or, it's coming. They've been developed over the years in terms of people looking at alternative ways of managing, uh, and, and certainly you've got a report there from the Gamekeepers Association, and I think that is an, an evolving process. It is about informing. It is about taking positive action against their own members where they see uh, people carrying on uh, practices that are from history and not not for the future. So that I wouldn't want to just focus on the negative. I, I can't. If, if the evidence has been taken away before I've even become aware of it, it's a bit like you know, um, I, I couldn't possibly. So know I'm that. not casting aspersions. I'm not saying that this is going on. I'm asking you yeah. if, in Police Scotland's view, we may be seeing a change in behaviour that's potentially masking the scale of the problem if evidence is being disposed of. I think, you could just, I think you could make an assertion both ways, couldn't you? You, you? There will always be some that would seek to get round the law and, and try and mask that activity. And there will also be some positive correlations in relation to um, people taking the right activity about protecting the colonies, protecting the birds. Um, and it may well be, I, I, don't, I don't understand the ecological effects, but it may well be that, that birds move on away from areas uh, in, into other areas. I don't understand that well enough in terms of the science. But where if somebody came, it goes back to the point, if somebody came with the science that actually there should be nesting pairs here, we have to try and get to the bottom of that. And that's certainly where one of the challenges for us is, is, is where you get that absence. Uh, you get the absence of a crime or you get the absence of a species. The amount of time and effort that Police Scotland can commit a resource to that full time to try and find out whether something has or hasn't been committed in comparison with 
uh, investigating other sorts of criminality that takes place in the community. I, I would suggest that we're probably very busy over here and we wouldn't be able to commit a resource to that in most cases. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an absolute choice. Mm. Where crimes are reported to us or where incidents are reported to us, I would suggest right from the point of call handling, could we get better? Absolutely yes. But actually, where we take that, we do record it. We're subject to scrutiny on our incident recording and our management of incidents. Where we do think there's a crime, we do crime it and we do investigate. And as has been said by the Crown, you know, many of these things go on in places that are unwitnessed. The forensic evidence is unsubstantiated and the, and the case from the off is very weak. What we can do is try and commit resources earlier on in the process to try and secure the best evidence <coughs> and present the best case we possibly can. But that, that story that I've just told you there is the story of attrition. And it is the story from the first point of origin to the last and understanding it mm. and doing something about it in terms of the skills and knowledge and the whole prevention of intelligence and enforcement arena. Okay. So, Gary, you can... Uh, just to pick up on that point, if there was good evidence that someone had taken steps to conceal the wildlife crime that they had committed, and that's quite a big if, because mm. getting that evidence would be tricky. But that's the sort of thing that we would view very seriously. I mean, it is, in effect, akin to, for instance, the disposal of a body following a murder. And that could be looked at as a, a common law offence, attempting to pervert the course of justice or defeat the ends of justice, which has significant consequences. And we're always keen in appropriate circumstances to take proceedings in cases like that, because it is a warning to anybody else who might think about doing the same thing, that there are consequences to that. It would be pure speculation for me to say whether or not those who are engaged in wildlife crime are learning to cover their tracks better or not. I've, I've absolutely no idea. But what I can say is that, unfortunately, criminals learn. Absolutely. And our forensic techniques become public knowledge in this area, just as they are in everything else. Mobile phones are very, very useful tools for the police, but criminals are learning to be more covert about how they deal with them. I'm sure there are those who are sufficiently forensically aware when they're committing wildlife crime to take steps to deal with that. If we had evidence to back that up in a particular case, I would be very interested in that. It's not something that we see coming through, but again, as you were saying, on a speculative basis, it may be happening. I simply don't know. Logic suggests it may be happening because the more success you have and people see that individuals are being jailed for raptor persecution, one would expect that might drive a change in behaviour, positively perhaps, but also negatively in terms of disguising um, their activities. Uh, absolutely, that's, that, that's the challenge, isn't it? You know, uh, criminals who uh, conduct criminal activity will always try and stop one head, step ahead of the, of the police service. Um, the challenge to us is to try and get ahead of them and, and break that cycle. Uh, and, and we will commit resource where we possibly can to do that. And certainly, you know, uh, we'll give you the assurances. If we, if we had evidence or intelligence to suggest that somebody was doing that, we would follow that up with a, a significant investigation. OK, thanks. Uh, Claudia Beamish wants to come in on a slightly different... Subject. Right. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, could I turn our, our focus to um, international trade in um, endangered species of wild flora and fauna? And I understand there's a, an international convention on that. And uh, I, I, I note for the public record that there was only one incident recorded in 2014-15, but it, it was um, in relation to 10 offences. Um, in Fife um, about an endangered species. So it would be helpful um, either now or in writing to know how that um, case or the cases is progressing. But also you say um, uh, in the report on page 30 that Police Scotland expect the numbers of recorded offences to increase in the future years due to increased public awareness um, and reporting of illegal wildlife trading, particularly online. And I wonder if um, what measures you're putting in place um, to reflect that concern? 
Well, in, terms, well, in terms of the CITES, I mean, yeah, uh, there's absolutely no doubt. It's like uh, probably uh, many other areas of criminality, the, the upsurge in online activity and online criminal activity is, is clearly there uh, and is going to going to increase. And it's certainly part of our work uh, as an organisation, looking to our three, five, ten year strategy, looking at our uh, operating model and how we deal with online criminality, and this will be part of it. Um, there's, uh, I mean, we've got a number of cases ongoing just now, reporting of, uh, of uh, illegal activity on, on CITES. Uh, we've had recent cases in, in, in Fife with tire claws, uh, auction houses that are selling, obviously, illegal material. Uh, so all, all positive work going on. Um, we have uh, training coming up uh, this year uh, with our UK Border Force um, uh, colleagues, uh, both for ourselves and Crown Office, around the whole uh, the issue of, uh, of the trade and endangered species. So there's a lot of positive work ongoing. Uh, in relation to that, in terms of the, the case that's currently sitting with you, Gary, I don't know. I'll provide a separate update as part of the written update in relation to the back cases as well, if that's acceptable. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, moving on, uh, Dave Stewart. Uh, Good morning, panel. Um, uh, I'd like to find out your views on your assessments of increasing the SSPCA's power to investigate wildlife crime. Well, obviously, this, uh, this subject was uh, discussed at last year's uh, committee meeting, and uh, you know we made a, uh, a written submission to the review by the government about our thoughts uh, around uh, you know the, the additional powers to the SSPCA, uh, which uh, you know are part of record. So uh, we're still awaiting uh, the outcome of the government's decision uh, on that. Uh, there are a number of uh, organisational, logistical, and, and legal uh, challenges, I think, to investing additional powers in the SSPCA again, which is public record of our submission uh, around that. So, uh, so really, we've, we've kind of, we want to work with all our partner agencies very closely, and we'd encourage in any incident the SSPC deals with, uh, and you know, that we do work with them in, in, in certain uh, occasions, but they're, uh, they're uh, potentially opportunities to develop that relationship further. Uh, and uh, you know, they, their current remit is about animal welfare and neglect. We investigate crime. We want to investigate with them wherever possible. Uh, I think going back to one of the previous uh, topics where uh, there are occasions where we're not told about uh, some of the instances that they do investigate, um, and they report directly into the Crown Office. Uh, it might be helpful if we were involved in some of them, but again, that's then a case-by-case -case basis, and we would encourage that interaction mm. as uh, widely as possible. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Scott. For those that haven't the benefit of remembering your evidence uh, last year, is it fair to summarise the two main criticisms you had? It was first of all that you saw the SSPCA having a conflict as an animal welfare um, charity, and secondly, whether effectively they were up to the detailed regulatory requirements that the police have to follow. Is that a fair summary of the two main points that you raised last time? Pretty, pretty much, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's absolutely it. I mean, it's a, a kind of that, that investigative accountability. We are, we are scrutinised, obviously, by Parliament, by HMICS, in terms of uh, all our activity, uh, that, that legal uh, obligation we have uh, around that. Um, you know, the access to specialist services that we have that uh, they don't have as well, that statutory responsibility, the primacy that we have as well for investigating crime uh, too, uh, and, uh, you know, resources and oversight. So, yeah, there's a number of issues that we highlighted, uh, and, uh, you know, we'll await that government outcome. And I'll probably be with Mr Johnston as well on, on that issue. I mean, since you gave that evidence, I mean, have you had discussions with government or the um, SSPCA about some of your criticisms? Uh, with the government, we've just wait, I mean, we've, we've submitted. No, we haven't had recent discussions about that. Uh, we've had discussions the fact that um, you know, with the cabinet secretary, that uh, she's still to you know make a decision or 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 has to announce the, the result of the government's review. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, in terms of detailed discussion, that recently, no, we haven't. Yeah. Um, Thank you. My question, Mr. To Mr. Johnson, is I think Mr. Johnson earlier you talk rightly about intelligence-led investigation being crucial, and I don't think anyone is suggesting that your prime role uh, as on Police Scotland for investigate wildlife crime has changed. What we're talking about is the argument that your team is enhanced by having more investigatory powers to a partner agency who have a lot of expertise. I mean, from the outside perspective and maybe simplistic perspective, what is the problem with that? I mean, generally with a low prosecution and detection rate for wildlife crime, you're enhancing your team. What's the problem? I think there's the submission in the two areas that I think were the objection, um, I, th I think, probably remain. I think what we did say was we would seek uh, changes in the legislation to enable, alongside their charitable function, where they uh, found evidence of wildlife crime being committed. Uh, it was our submission that they should be able to, to seize and retain 
the evidence of that and then inform the police that have the statutory obligation to do that. That doesn't conflict with their charitable status. It is work that we can do alongside a partner agency that plays to both strengths in the eyes of the public that we serve and the charity status uh, that, that has there. So I, I, think, I think that was a very reasonable compromise and that change in the legislation I think would meet the needs of the public and it would certainly meet the needs of uh, better informing us around wildlife crime where that is taking place and the ability to prosecute it and investigate it appropriately. You know, the, the detectives that I have go through rigorous training, selection and accreditation in terms of their ability to do that. Um, I think there is a, a conflict there in terms of the charitable status. But again, the suggested amendment in relation to the power to seize, retain and inform the police um, plays to both partners' strengths. It seems a very sensible compromise. So if I can summarise like this, you've no objection to enhancing your team, but there needs to be some regulatory and legal changes in terms of charitable status and other issues in order for that to work for you? Uh, absolutely. You know, the, the strength, strengthening the team, you know, we, we sit here as, as accountable bodies and you're going to hear from other agencies. The, the, the reality against the fight against wildlife crime is it's a significant team of which, you know, it, I, I like to think of my lot as the strikers. Uh, we still need the defenders, the goalkeepers and everybody else. Uh, part of my role strategically is to make sure that we've got that coordination there, that, that we can actually play to each other's strengths. Uh, whether some of those sit with statutory powers and regulatory powers or whether they sit there in just terms of a general interest and a desire to have a positive impact. I'll work with anybody that wants to work towards those goals. And it might increase your strike rate as well, if I can keep the football analogy Hopefully. going. Uh, <laughs> Mr Aiken, can you perhaps give me your views um, on the point I made earlier? The, the issue sounds superficially quite simple, just to give extra powers. That's fine as long as the legislation is framed in an appropriate way that it will be free from challenge further down the line. Uh, and there may well be a need for an increased accountability or regulatory framework to ensure that those powers can be properly exercised in accordance with the Human Rights Act and so on, so that the end product that we're getting is something that we can use. I'm happy to get good cases with enough evidence from any authorised reporting agency, and SSPCA have great expertise in a lot of matters and report very many cases to us from their welfare uh, main hat but we don't want them to be put in a position of having enhanced powers that aren't fully properly set out and cause them or us difficulties further down the line well i think from my perspective i mean i think that's been very positive feedback from the panel. It's, I'm sure government will be hearing this. Uh, what we need is clean, tidy legislation with good draftsmanship of the legislation that's compliant with human rights. And I certainly would welcome that. Can I just move on? Right. To, to, to get a point of clarity, Claudia Beams has got a question. <coughs> just a, a point for yourself, Gary, just in relation to how, could you clarify, well, I understand the, the, the importance of um, legislation being um, clean and effective, as, as my colleague has said, David Stewart. How would human rights be relevant in this case? Well, not in this case, but in, in this... In general, yeah. the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights runs through everything that the criminal justice system does, and any power of the state and in this context, SSPCA, who have a slightly odd constitutional position, but they would become ever more part of the, the state mechanism in those circumstances, those powers must be proportionate and uh, exercised proportionately and must be capable of complying with the Human Rights Act. Although we're focusing on wildlife here, the accused will be subject to the Human Rights Act because even companies, although they're not human, do have rights under uh, ECHR. So we want to be sure that anything that we get works. And the parliamentary draftsmen are very good at dealing with that, but that's my main concern. There's no point getting something if it's not actually going to do what you wanted it to do in the first place. On the record, Dave Stewart wants to move things on. Thank you, uh, Kavir. Could I just move on?
two penalties for wildlife crime, which has been mentioned in some of the evidence earlier. Um, I think a number of uh, members of the panel mentioned uh, Professor uh, Putsti's uh, report at Strathclyde University uh, into penalties. Um, government's obviously considering that, and the previous minister, Dr Ailey MacLeod, uh, accepted these recommendations, and clearly we're awaiting further legislation from government. So obviously I appreciate this is an issue uh, for the Scottish Government. But just for the record, the recommendation would be under summary a £40,000 fine maximum uh, and 12 months imprisonment and under indictment up to five years imprisonment. And that would require um, fresh, uh, le uh, not necessarily fresh legislation in the sense of standalone legislation, but it could be on the back of existing legislation that's going through Parliament. Has there been a recent discussion with the Crown Offices or Police Scotland about the issues of penalties? And I think it was Mr Aiken mentioning the Scottish uh, sentencing guidelines on this. Perhaps you, Mr Aiken, I'll start with you. Could you say a little bit more about this? And presumably a naive level increasing penalties uh, would deter criminals taking part in the criminal process. That's a whole psychological and social discussion that I'm not in a position to get into at all. Uh, from my point of view, we will work with whatever penalties we are given. But in other similar regulatory fields, the penalties on some of the complaint are higher. For instance, health and safety matters, which is another part of my remit, the maximum penalty in summary complaint is £20,000, which is considerably higher than the standard. I certainly haven't been involved in any discussions with the government about the implementation of the review. In many respects, that's we're really neutral as far as that's concerned. We will work with what we're given. But it certainly provides a degree more flexibility of how cases can be dealt with. For instance, a case that's going to attract a penalty of less than £40,000 could then be on summary complaint. Summary complaint is generally more efficient and effective and speedier than an indictment process, although not always. To come on to the second part that you are discussing, the Scottish Sentencing Council, again, an entirely standalone agency from the Crown, but I certainly welcome the fact that one of their first priorities is to look at wildlife crime, and I think that Again, just speculatively in my own head, I think that says something very important about how society and how the criminal justice system view the importance of wildlife crime. Yeah, Mr. Johnson, hmm. I think I don't think I've not been involved in any conversations in relation to the implementation of it. I think I'd echo the point that that um, sentencing does tend to echo. Uh, society's acceptance of certain levels of criminality and certainly an increase in that could could only probably benefit in terms of its um, its effect on deterring others from taking up those crime unfortunately it would be retrospective i.e somebody's got to commit the offense and be sentenced for that um, again i would want to use that as part of a suite um, you know it's, it's not for me to determine these things but uphold the law but uh, certainly I can't see that it would cause us any harm. It could only be a benefit in the message that we're sending to the whole of society about the importance of the matter. Mr Scott? No, other than our involvement in uh, Professor Pousty's uh, original review, we've not had uh, any recent dialogue around uh, that. And obviously, uh, Deputy Chief Constable Desinick Levinson has been appointed on to the Scottish Sentencing Council. And obviously, you know, we'll do everything we can to help them in, in whatever the work they want to take forward in relation to wildlife crime. So. Thank you. Or two in your armoury. Oh, absolutely. You're simply seeing a headline. Uh, if, if somebody's engaged in a criminal activity and they see a headline where somebody else has just been sentenced to five years, uh, hopefully would make them stop and think in their tracks. So from that perspective, it would be. But also going into schools, you know, again, I would want to be talking about the carrot type approach with those, but, but alluding to the fact that there are quite stiff penalties. That's not for the police. That, that's for us to deliver the message. But that's for society to say these things are wrong and the level of sentence, if it's if it's a lot lower than that, people will think, well, I'll, well, I'll risk that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Angus MacDonald. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. Um, if we could turn to vicarious liability and the uh, Land, <coughs> Land Reform Act uh, that uh, came through Parliament last year. Um, we've recently seen some cases brought forward uh, under the vicarious liability provisions, um, the first case concluding in December 2014. And, of course, the Land Reform Act from last year it provides for the creation of a public register of persons uh, who, who have controlling interests in land. So I'm curious to, to, to hear what your 
uh, experiences of using the vicarious liability provisions, and do you think the public register of controlling interests will allow for more convictions, uh, and will the possibility of a prosecution against uh, the person with a controlling interest and the subsequent sentence uh, act as a deterrent? So we, we, I mean, any investigation will take uh, every opportunity it can to, to, uh, to utilise that, that piece of legislation. Um, it's, uh, it's still uh, few and far between just now, to be quite honest, in terms of those opportunities, but both in terms of vicarious liability and uh, opportunities to, to seize assets, uh, we, we will do that. Um, I mean, in terms of the legislation, we, we explained last year that uh, uh, identifying, as you rightly point out, the landowner can be very problematic, especially when they're, they're sitting abroad, uh, perhaps in some tax haven or, or wherever else, and there's a chain of uh, responsibility which ends up in some local market manager looking after the estate and uh, so uh, to, to prosecute that individual is probably a, a subject that Gary uh, will have a, a firm view on so I'll maybe pass over to you for that Gary. It, it is a difficult process sometimes to identify the, the ownership of the land but in addition for this matter we also need to be looking at who has the beneficial right as far as sporting or game control on land is concerned and that can also be very tricky to establish. Uh, the criminal killing of a wildlife species and land has sometimes been described to me as a murder investigation with a serious fraud investigation tacked on to the end of it. And that, although it may sound a bit glib, is not actually that far away from the reality. As we've already discussed, there can be significant hurdles in proving the crime. There's then the area of expertise that detective officers are generally very good at, but it takes a lot of time and effort unpicking all the paperwork to get you back to where you want to be. And where that takes you isn't always helpful if it is some offshore corporation that turns out to be the, the <coughs> owner. But any clarity, anything that makes it simpler for us to drive away through that paperwork is always welcome. Okay, thanks. Uh, the, the issue of, of tracing um, the owners is, is, is clearly a, an issue, and I think we're all aware of uh, a specific case where um, <coughs> it, it wasn't possible to bring a vicarious liability case following the conviction of gamekeeper George Much um, because the employer couldn't be identified. Um, what efforts specifically on that case were made to identify uh, Mr. Mutchie's employer. To be quite frank, and again, it goes back to that sort of layering uh, of ownership and uh, trying to establish uh, in international inquiries uh, who exactly the owner was. Uh, and we had a number of experts working on that uh, to, to assist in the, in the investigation. And uh, I'm afraid we couldn't quite get there. So uh, it, is, it is a challenge. Uh, those investigations that are ongoing um, just now around Vicky are providing a challenge as well. Uh, so that, that clarity about uh, you know, land ownership and, and who, who we can pursue uh, is, is obviously welcome. That's a hugely important point, and, and this Parliament will be coming to look in at the nature of transparency in the next few months, certainly in the course of this year. It might be helpful for us to get on the record today from yourselves as, as being at the front line of this. What degree of transparency would you require in order to deal with cases like these? Who's, who's the owner and who's responsible for uh, running that estate? If that, if that ties in with uh, the legislation in terms of the ability of the Crown Office to prosecute, then uh, that specific identification of an individual f that is liable for any activity on that estate, uh, that is, that, that's, that's that clarity that we're looking for. Company, what we need to know is who benefits from the ownership. Absolutely. You know, so the accountability mechanism within Police Scotland sits, you know, my DCS reports to me as an ACC, I report to my DEP as a DCC, and the Chief Constable is the accountable and responsible body. Why doesn't that exist in other areas, particularly where, in terms of land ownership, land management, you know, written down here, willful, willful ignorance of criminality is, is not a defence. Well, actually, these people know that an awful lot of activity is taking place on these estates, and if they don't know, they should know, because they, they need, need to take more than a passive role in the management of the asset that they have, particularly where criminality could take place. So anything that can be brought in that would provide that clarity to us in terms of who is the accountable and responsible person. Because in the very least, in the preventative space, it gives us someone to engage in 
around doing things right in the first place. That, that's what every good citizen, whether they're a citizen of Scotland or a citizen of the world, that's what we would seek to engage them for. But where they fall foul of the law or they are willfully ignorant of the law, we need to make sure that we can pursue that and present the evidence to the Crown. Thanks. Um, just following on from that, what, what um, impact uh, will general licensing, which we've discussed earlier, have on helping to, to concentrate minds, for example? Um, the withdrawal of a general licence for anyone with a controlling interest who has been convicted through vicarious liability. Yeah, sorry, I didn't pick up on part of what you said there. Just the, the, the actual core of the question. Well, the, the withdrawal of um, a general licence uh, following a conviction by someone through uh, vicarious liability, um, that would clearly help to concentrate minds. And we welcome that on every yes. occasion. <laughs> That's just okay. we said. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, let's move on to our final theme, uh, Jenny Goldruth. Um, in 2014-15, there were only two offences uh, which were recorded in relation to fox hunting with dogs, uh, but I understand that neither of these cases were referred on to the Procurator Fiscal. And only one prosecution ever uh, involving fox hunting has ever led to an actual prosecution in 2010-11. I wonder if you can account for why that might be the case. Again, it's, uh, it's evidence. Uh, it's yeah. the, the, the quality and uh, the quantity of evidence that uh, supports uh, the, the, the criminal activity and that we can present to the Crown to then uh, prosecute. Um, uh, I know there was much made of video footage previously in some of these instances where uh, you know there's a, a particular frame and that suggests there is uh, a criminal activity, but actually uh, the whole issue here was about flushing to guns uh, and just because an image doesn't show the guns in the, the, the footage doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there. So, you know, there are, there are a number of cases where we've scoured, uh, you know, hours of footage to see if we can get uh, information or evidence that would uh, support uh, illegal uh, sort of fox hunting, but, you know, it's been very difficult. So, um, uh, there is a huge amount of effort that goes into uh, these investigations uh, to try and gain the evidence. And obviously, we welcome Lord Bonamy's uh, recent review into the Protection of Wild Mammals uh, uh, Act uh, because he's made a number of recommendations, interestingly, as well, on the subject of vicarious liability that perhaps the landowner then becomes responsible for any activity on the land that may be illegal. Obviously, we need to establish it as illegal, and the challenge, but again, his recommendations are going to improve, I think, our ability, and we were a big part of the consultation process on that, our ability to, uh, to gather evidence, and it's simplifying definitions for those that are taking part in legal activities and allowing us to identify activity that is illegal because of... Uh, so hopefully, as the government obviously are assessing that just now, but... Uh, but we, we welcome the recommendations and are obviously keen to work closely with the government to, uh, to take forward them. One of, the, sorry, uh, one of the recommendations that Lord Bonamy made was that there should be an appointment of an independent um, monitor who would kind of oversee what happened in terms of fox hunting and, and kind of monitor it on a random basis, uh, the report recommended. Um, how do you think that might work in practice? Um, I don't see why it shouldn't work, um, uh, personally. I mean, in terms of... I mean, I was very encouraged by uh, the, the attitude of the, 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 the Fox Sound, uh, the Mounted Pack uh, leaders. We had a meeting with them uh, during last year, uh, which was, um, uh, was, was organised through Jamie Stewart, uh, the Scottish Countryside Alliance, and we met with all the leaders. They were happy to engage uh, in producing a voluntary protocol, a uh, code of practice around their activity, uh, be more transparent, engage with the police before the hunt, tell us who the guns are, uh, inform us at the start and finish so that we could, you know, effectively be part of that uh public confidence building and the activities uh, is uh, uh, illegal. Uh, so, uh, so we welcome that. An independent monitor, I don't see why it couldn't work. I mean, obviously, uh, is it a paid role? Is it a, a non-paid role? Um, I don't know, but uh, I don't see why it shouldn't work. Scott, I think you were quoted in a recent Countryside Alliance press release um, from the 1st of January. Um, I'm not even sure if you're, you're aware of this, but it, you apparently said that there's no evidence to suggest that the mounted foxhound packs that exist are acting out with the legislation that is in place at the moment. Now, I think that quote was taken from January last year. Is that still your view? Yes, I mean, I've not, I've not, at the moment, 
Uh, in terms of uh, the, the PAC's activities, uh, I have nothing to suggest concrete that they are uh, operating out with the law. Uh, and uh, I am more than willing to, again, you know, myself and my colleagues work further with them to try and en enhance uh, sort of voluntary protocol uh, and engage with us prior to uh, events and afterwards uh, to, to make sure that the activity is, is, uh, is legal. Um, so, you know, we will, we, will, we will obviously respond to any intelligence or information that suggests it is not. Uh, but uh, in the absence of that, then you know we will work with them to make sure it is uh, above board. Isn't that at odds with your submissions to the Bonamy review? In in what sense, sorry? Isn't that at odds with Police Scotland's submissions to the Bonamy review? No, I mean I think it's not at odds in the sense that if you're talking about specific intelligence to me, but that perception that there may be. Uh, the activity that only, uh, is part of these funds that it could potentially be illegal. Yes, I mean, there, of course it could be. I mean, you know, we're not there to monitor them. We're not there to observe it. So there may be, uh, but all we, are, we, all we were doing was submitting on the basis that it would be far, far easier if there was more clarity of definition, more clarity of roles and responsibilities to allow us then to investigate and to present a case where uh, otherwise it is challenging at the moment. Emma Harper. Just a follow-up question, supplementary. It's um, regarding mounted hunts and uh, if you're talking to a pack leader and they're telling you about how many guns and who has the guns and, and all of that, there's about nine hunts, I think, in Scotland right now. Do they all practice locally in a good way, as you're describing, that they'll tell you when the hunt is? Is it a week ahead of time? Is it the day off? Is it the morning off? Who are the guns? Do they all actually practice in a, a good way like that? At the moment, it's uh, a bit of a mixed economy. Some are doing that. Uh, I haven't gone into specific activities of each hunt just now personally, but I know that there is a, a willingness to do that. Uh, and I know that, uh, that some of them are engaging, whether or not all are engaging uh, specifically based on the, the, the protocol just now. I couldn't say that with uh, uh, any absolute assurance just now. But my impression is, I mean, another part of this as well is that uh, the hunts are welcoming uh, local officers to come and observe uh, and understand a bit about the dynamics of the hunt. So again, Jamie Stewart through the Scottish Countryside Alliance is, is facilitating our engagement with the hunts to, uh, to observe activities, see how they start, see how they finish, see how they're conducted, so that local officers are more aware of the dynamics. And then if information comes into the public that suggests, well, there's something uh, illegal happening here, then it might not be because the local officers are aware of where the hunt's uh, taking place, uh, and therefore, you know, they can reassure the public that way. So uh, there's a lot of positive work on the going in terms of that prevention and understanding of the, the dynamics of, uh, of, of, of pest control, effectively. So. Gentlemen, can I thank you for your time this morning? I think it's been extremely useful. You've undertaken to write to the committee with uh, further information, but can I also encourage, as I did earlier, to bear in mind that the committee's interest in wildlife crime extends way beyond simply looking at the annual report. So pieces of work that you've undertaken to do, perhaps with Scottish Badgers, for example, I think we would welcome updates and anything going forward that you think is relevant to our uh, area of interest. I, I'm going to suspend for five minutes till we change the panel. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We continue our discussions of the Scottish Government's Wildlife Crime in Scotland Annual Report 2015. We are now joined by a different panel of stakeholders. These are namely Eddie Palmer, the Chair of Scottish Badgers, Andy Smith, who is a committee member of the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, Ian Thompson, Head of Investigations at the RSPB, and Peter Charleston, the Conservation Wildlife Crime Officer for the Bat Conservation uh, Trust. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, we will move swiftly on to um, questions and uh, Kate Forbes. Great, thank you. Good morning. So the previous committee, the Racky Committee, was critical of the way that information was presented in the Wildlife Crime Report because it made it difficult to see trends and to scrutinise the information. I'd like to know what your own thoughts are on the improvements in this year's report, such as presenting the data by financial year, and how what suggestions of improvements could be made to future years? Ian Thompson. Bart, uh, many thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to the committee this morning. I think certainly from RSPB's perspective, we have seen year-on-year -year improvements in the Scottish Government's annual report. It contains a greater level of information. There is definitely more clarity. Um, obviously, it was raised earlier, our concerns that the, a handful of incidents perhaps weren't presented in the report for whatever reasons. And the only other comment I would make is it might be clearer specifically if the number of victims of crime for each incident were, were listed. For example, if it was a poisoning case where there were two or three victims, that that was actually specified in each incident. <coughs> but other than that, I think that the report continues to go from strength to strength. And if the sort of scientific basis for some of the concerns was also highlighted, and the fact that what we are dealing with is, is only a proportion of what is actually going on, i.e. the tip of the iceberg that, that was referred to in the previous session, I think that's important. But it's, it's certainly a good report. Why, on what basis do you say it's just the tip of the iceberg? I think it's very clear that with wildlife crime that we are only detecting a proportion of, of offences. There have certainly been a number of cases, for example, one I think highlighted in our submission where uh, an individual was observed shooting two buzzards. And when the police did a follow-up search on that particular case, I think a further 11 buzzards were found hidden down adjacent rabbit holes. There are numerous other cases where um, evidence is found concealed or partially concealed. We're dealing with cases now in the report where the number of, of birds that are shot that has been found is, is actually quite surprising. Uh, the reason I say that is if I was to shoot a protected bird of prey, the last thing I would do is leave it lying around for somebody to pick up. In most cases, you would imagine if a bird was shot and dropped in front of the perpetrator, they would do, every, do everything they could to conceal that evidence. The fact that X number of birds has been found shot makes you wonder, are these wounded birds that are maybe managing to move away a little bit and then succumbing to their wounds? That surely is just a proportion of what has actually been killed. That's the point I'm trying to get to for clarity. There's a difference between it being a proportion of and the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg suggests there is a colossal problem there that we're not identifying. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. I mean, work done in the, the north of Scotland red kite population, there was an award-winning paper published, um, I think, back in about 2008. And what it showed was that 41 red kites had been found illegally poisoned in the north of Scotland. But using population modelling, and this was rigorous... Um, you know, regularly used scientific modelling, that represented about a quarter of what the actual number of poisoned birds would have been. So that's the sort of numbers we're dealing with in that particular instance. So it was important to get clarity on that. Can we go back to the original question that uh, Kate Forbes posed, and I'll allow you gentlemen to come in on that. Yes. Come in. I'd agree with uh, much of what Ian says. Um, really, I haven't got any other comments about the, the, the report as it is. I think moving towards what was being talked about by the police earlier, which is that journey from the public re reporting something to it becoming an incident, an investigated one, and then maybe a crime, having that clear will, will be, would be a tremendous improvement. So that covers something else I was going to say anyway about badges. But as regards yes, the, the tip of the iceberg, um, one of the maybe difficulties is that um, 
both doing anything to badges by way of killing, injuring or taking away, uh, plus damaging their sets is illegal, full stop, that's it. And we find relatively few dead badges. Um, I mean, people might dispose of them if they did certain things to them, but we find an awful lot of dug sets. And there's a whole, history, whole thing there about historical uh, things. Um, so the ones that we're saying or we might report as crimes would be ones where it's been very recent, I'm talking about within days, but the, um, especially the work of our project in South Lanarkshire at the moment, um, that they, they're, with the public, are going out surveying and finding new sets and uh, monitoring old sets. And the, the rate of them having been historically disturbed is about 50%, which nobody knew about before. So there, there has been, or there is, a lot of crime about. Okay. Anyone else? Just coming back to the format of the report, uh, in previous years, BCT have contributed uh, some statistics to those reports, which have been published in relation to incidents rather than crimes. This year has seen the move to reported crimes, and bat persecution comes back as no crimes in Scotland for the period in question. At BCT, we are aware of a number of investigations undertaken by Police Scotland, uh, none of which resulted in crimes being recorded. And we have no difficulty with that. The problem, as far as we are concerned, about reporting on crimes rather than incidents is that for back persecution or back crime, there are many opportunities to prevent crime, probably more so than in most areas of wildlife crime. And we had a number of incidents where people contacted BCT or Police Scotland directly, raising concerns about developments impacting on bat roosts. That resulted in a visit from local wildlife crime officer with developers or owners being informed of the law and made aware that, you know, that an eye was being kept on what was going on there. And compliance with the law was both sought and achieved. Now, of course, no crimes were committed, so it was quite right for Police Scotland to make a nil report. But there was some excellent preventative work undertaken on a number of those incidents, and the extent of that work does not feature in the annual wildlife crime report. Okay. I suppose that's inevitable because it's a report on wildlife crime, but it's a good point to, to make. Andy Smith, do you have anything to say? Our point of view, I think, the report shows uh, generally, uh, uh, the way we see it anyway, is a downward thing. We always admit that there is going to be a lot of work in progress, a lot of work that's got to be done. Um, it, it is disappointing when you sit at the back and listen to the earlier evidence being given to discover that uh, there's incidents of um, wildlife crime, in particular raptor, uh, raptor persecution, that hasn't been reported to the police that should have been in this evidence. And I would say that's, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a failure in the police, but it's important that we have, that everybody has uh, that evidence. And if that evidence is there, then it, it should be up to the individuals, I would suggest, to make sure that the police know about it so that it can be reported. Um, Everything should be every every single thing should be reported to the police so that we know where, where we are with things. Um, certainly, it's it's looking as far as the tip of the iceberg goes. I don't necessarily know if if we go with that totally. Um, I think that it's um, it, it's perhaps I from what I see on the ground, if you like, I definitely see a massive massive change from what we had 20, 30 years ago uh, in the industry. Um, Massive change, massive change in both what's happening on the ground and attitudes as well. And I think that's, that's important from, from our point of view. In terms of, of, of moving on perhaps to the next theme, in terms of, of uh, changing attitude, and I raised earlier on the point of whether you as an organisation have been uh, welcomingly uh, critical of raptor persecution, but can you put your hand in heart and say that all of your members are cooperating with investigations on the ground. The point that the RSPB made in their written evidence was that perhaps in these rural settings, people still felt intimidated about breaking ranks and um, spilling the beans, basically, about things they were aware of. Do you think that cultural change has happened uh, amongst your members? I think about that is I can't speak for individual members at the, at the end of the day. What I can say is, though, that I, I read the RSP report and they, they classify something as a culture of silence. It's every individual's right to remain silent if they want. 
and it is a very difficult thing that, that you're trying to break into there. Um, if the person is accused of something, then they have that absolute right, as every citizen does, to remain silent. I don't see it as a culture of silence. Um, I think attitudes are changing slowly, but they are changing. And in terms of, of, of the general picture, because I don't want to get completely bogged down and wrapped up persecution today because there's other subjects to cover, but in terms of, of um, the situation there, there may well be an improvement nationally or there may not be, but you know, there was a report recently that showed the complete absence of a particular species from a sizeable area of our country, which does lend itself to, to leaving you wondering why. The Assistant Chief Constable said earlier on there about academia and how that can be quite important. Um, there are, and I'm a very much a, a, a bird geek, I like, I like my birds, I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, um, but it goes back to there, there are places in this country that should have um, birds of prey, in particular raptors, that don't have them. That includes some RSPB reserves that have got the perfect, the perfect Abernethy as an example. Don't think there's very much on Abernethy. It does a breeding raptors Abernethy? So, so there's pl we can all <laughs> differ here. So I, I think that you know there are all sorts of things, reasons why they may not be there. But it, it's it's easy to point the finger unless you've perhaps got um, academia behind you that's going to perhaps suggest that maybe other reasons, for what other reasons, disturbance, whatever it could be, that, that you know, birds of prey aren't going to go back to a particular area, they are going to go back to an area, whatever. An 11% increase in recorded wildlife crime during the period in question, and that does leave you one considering whether there's enough of a deterrent uh, against wildlife crime. Uh, this is a, a general question to the panel. Um, you know, when you look at the fact that 23% of the cases, no actions taken, um, and we've already discussed earlier this morning about the scale of the penalties that are available, do we have enough in place to deter individuals who would carry out all of these kinds of actions? I suspect, and, and not specifically related to raptors, but when an individual undertakes a wildlife crime, he's got to make a judgment call, and that is, what are the benefits of me committing the crime? What are the chances of me being caught? And if I am caught, what support will I get? Or what is the penalty I may potentially face? And I think up until the, 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 the Professor Pousty led review, we had significant concerns about penalties that were being um, given by the courts in relation to, for example, possession of pesticides that had been banned for sort of 10 or 15 years, where more often than not, there was a fairly minimal level of, of financial penalty. In some cases where there were multiple offences, there was, there was potentially a, a community, community disposal awarded, but certainly there was very little in terms of, in our perception, a deterrence, particularly for raptor persecution, when you contrast that with egg collecting cases, for example, where egg collectors were regularly given custodial penalties and arguably the impact of stealing a clutch of golden eagle eggs is significantly less than that of killing an adult golden eagle. So there were a lot of inconsistencies across the board. I think the, the Pousty Review has really addressed that and recognised those concerns and certainly from RSPB's perspective, we, we look forward to his recommendations being implemented. But what about the wider uh, issue of deterrence right across the, the wildlife uh, crime uh, spectrum? Andy Smith. I think that uh, you're probably getting it right, and it does send a message out. There's no doubt about that. And another thing to consider as well when it comes to certain individuals, and if you're specifically looking at wildlife crime where perhaps a shooting has been involved or whatever, then someone is going to lose perhaps their job, they're going to lose their house, they're going to lose their, their, their family house maybe, they're going to lose their, their right, to, well, not a right, I should say, that they're going to lose their, their firearms and shotgun certificate, which is extremely difficult to get a hold of in the first place in Scotland, and rightly so. Um, so it, there's a, although there might not be specific um, penalties for individuals, there's also the knock-on effects to and individuals' actions. So we, we hear of developers who um, have bat roosts to deal with, making inquiries and finding out what average fines are for bat crimes and suggesting that such fines would be paid out their petty cash funds. 
Um, that's something we struggled with for many years and where we've had cases of developers being fined £30 for developing a, for destroying a bat roost, you can understand that. There was, however, uh, a, an interesting case last year in Derbyshire where actually a developer was um, hit with a proceeds crime confiscation order, so he lost all the profit he made from cutting corners, and I think that is a very dissuasive measure, and I think it's something we would look at for, for future cases uh, across the UK. Certainly that case uh, was very widely reported in, in the industry, uh, and, and I think it's, it's going to do much to improve the situation. Okay. Interesting. Eddie Palmer. Things I can mention, just carrying on about developers, because half of budget crime is by people for development, agricultural, forestry purposes, damaging badger sets, and doing that without a license to be working near them as well. And um, we had an historic case, which is a few years ago now, of a house builder um, who built a house within the inside the permitted distance um, to a badger set. And they were fined for that. And my memory was it was either two or three thousand uh, pounds, but the house was selling for three hundred and fifty thousand pounds. So that gives you an answer about that. Um, if I can just switch to the, the other bit, which is about uh, badger baiting, badger digging and baiting is almost entirely by the dog fighting gangs. And the intelligence about that is very strong. We learn some of that from SSPCA. We pick it up from local people. And that does go into what we feed into intelligence, which is going straight to Police Scotland now. And it's very difficult that the public think that if you give a name and address and go and knock on the door of the guy and take the dogs off them, which of course is not the case at all. Um, people do not have their front doors knocked down in this country unless there's you know, um, enough uh, evidence for a warrant, and that's, that's what the law is about. Um, and certainly there's some individuals who have um, been found guilty of badger digging or baiting, um, and they received fines and um, community service, and I'm not under rating, you, you know, saying that the, that the court got it wrong at that point, uh, but in some case, I'm thinking of specifically the people back out you know, doing the same thing with dogs almost the next day. Um, okay. Just, just to wrap up this section, um, we talked earlier in the, the previous session about the PAW protocols and allegations that they're not always being followed by all of the partners, which is leading to some uh, concerns within the partnership, but also perhaps undermining the, the police's ability to, to, to catch the perpetrators. Are you aware of any instances where the PAW protocols have been broken, and, and is that a concern to you? Andrew can I, Smith. Yeah, can I come in on that one, please? Yeah, I, I've got one that was uh, raised last year, and I think it highlights um, perhaps the whole issue of things, and it does need to be, in my, in my view, in our view, look, needs to be looked at. Last year, just about a week before the grouse shooting season was due to start, there was a sensational headline, if you like, that eight golden eagles had gone missing over the past five years. Um, this is right at the time, just if you're looking as an, an ante, it's a perfect time to do it. Nobody had known about these eight eagles that had been over about the last five years prior to that. I actually, last night I actually went onto the government website and the poll website and I looked back at all the executive meeting minutes and there was no mention at all, all the way back to, I think I, went, I, think I looked to 2012 and then I had to go to bed and then I thought, no, there is no mention at all about this, you know, these eagles going missing. If eight eagles have gone missing over a five-year period, somebody should have known about that two years ago. And if you're all working as a, if we're all working as partners and we're all equal partners in this organisation, then perhaps at the very outset, if that, if that um, had been highlighted after year one, there's a bit of a question mark. Year two, we've got now we've got two eagles. Let's let's just do something about it. We're not very happy about it. That may have prevented the disappearance or the missing eagles. And I think it's things like that that go, I think, I think that we've got, there's conflict within the group, and that conflict, I think, has to get ironed out some way. I think we've got to move on. I think 25, 30 years ago, things were completely different what they are. Where we are just now is progressing, it's, but it's progressing slowly, but I think we all need to move on. And in that particular case, Paul, they certainly, it wasn't working, I, I would suggest. Okay, uh, Ian Thompson. Can I respond to that? Um, Andy said nobody knew. Well, that, that's actually incorrect because the police were aware, but all those satellite tag birds disappearance as and when they disappeared. 
Um, as to when the press release went out, I think the feeling was in order to have a significant impact, given that these birds all disappeared in areas where there was significant, uh, where grouse shooting management was the significant land use, I think it's entirely appropriate that at the start of the grouse shooting season, that is the time to when to put out that information. There have been a number of investigations where satellite tagged eagles have been found. For example, there was a poison bird found in the Angus Glens back in, I think it was 2009. That ha has not stopped further birds disappearing. That was all over the media at the time. It was subject of a significant police operation at the time. Um, two further satellite tagged eagles are known to have been illegally killed as a result of activities in the Angus Glen subsequent to that. So I think what you're doing is, is really pulling the wool over people's eyes. And in actual fact, there's usually attempts to shoot the messenger rather than to deal with the actual problem. Just to be clear, though, you said known to be. That's different from proven to be. And we're dealing with a wildlife crime report that's based upon convictions or the belief that there's a crime. I, I don't want to get into the politics of this sure. issue, I'm, 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 because we all know how fraught that is. I want to particularly look at the the, the, the poor protocols. There, there's a dispute over whether they worked effectively in that instance. But in general, is there a problem? Are they not working sufficiently well? Or do they represent progress in this area? Progress, and, and certainly the, the satellite tagging review, which was written in, uh, sorry, the satellite tagging protocol, which I think was written in 2013, the Paw Scotland Raptor Group is now undertaking a review of that protocol to make it more, more fit for purpose. So I think certainly that's working. In terms of the, the media protocol, I think the, the, the chair of the PAWS media group is probably the best person to advise on whether they think that one is working or not. OK, OK. OK, let's move on and look at uh, badgers. Claudia Beamish. Right, thank you, convener. Um, good morning to the panel. And I'd like to um, ask uh, you, Eddie, um, some questions. But of course, if others have comments, then they'd be most welcome to, to contribute them. Uh, you will have heard the. It, evidence um, in the first panel, I think, and uh, it would be helpful if you could highlight how the concerns that were highlighted in your written evidence um, could be um, improved upon and tell us a bit more about those um, uh, in, in opening uh, in relation to um, crime, both uh, for, for those who regard quite wrongly badgers as a pest and also um, those who, who might be um, tempted into using them for, for baiting. Yes, okay, okay thanks. <laughs> um, just, I'll just preempt that by saying that, um, if I go back a bit, during the end of last year, because of my concern about our figures, which for the la first nine months of this year, you know, those last March, December, are running at about the same, uh, and I, you know, I've got the actual details with me, I've been in contact with Sergeant Andy Maven, who's in contact with Police Scotland, and we've been talking about presentation of figures. And, and just very recently, what's been suggested is that we maybe start sharing um, ongoing issues and figures on a monthly basis, so that we pin down exactly and immediately, we think there's a case, if we put it this way, uh, a crime being committed. It starts off in the process with the police, and some on the other end knows that it's somewhere through the process. And almost all the, if you like, disparity in the figures, I think, applies to damaged badger sets, because that's the main thing that we see and we find out. And our sort of core figures, like that 40-odd a year, those are situations where there's been a known badger set, it was known it was not disturbed at some point, soon after it's been disturbed, sometimes grossly, it's been seen by one of our members, in most of those will have been seen by a police officer as well. And then we go into, is this going to be an offence to be prosecuted? And uh, I mean, all I can say is that, um, although given extremely conscientious work by police officers, and this is from divisions all over Scotland, though I mainly deal with the east of Scotland, um, because just where I live, um, things disappear, is all I can say. So someone decides at some point, that this is either an historic crime, there isn't enough evidence, but they haven't come back to me, um, or there's something else. 
and often what I get, I'm not blaming individuals for this, is maybe, it's usually a phone call, it's not anything in writing, some months afterwards when I've been inquiring and pushing um, to say, no, it's been dropped, or it's not proceeding, or there's not enough evidence. That doesn't mean to say there's anything sinister about that, but I don't think the system is good enough. And the sorts of things we were hearing this morning in the first panel are I extremely good news, you know, that there's a willingness to look at that. So it's the this procession, as um, I think the ACC was saying, you know, from uh, a member of the public makes a complaint. So that could be a member of the public, it could be one of us, one of our members, same status anyway, obviously. And uh, tracking what happens is extremely difficult at the moment getting hold of a police officer who's once been with on an investigation can be very difficult. It's not because people are being difficult or obstructive, it's because they're extremely busy and they're out all the time. If there's one WCO in an area, or even if there's two or three, they're busy. Somebody else can't answer for them. Um, people can't really take messages for them. So the community, there are large communication difficulties, and that's where most of this lies at. But I would say at the base of this, um, the Badgers Act was improved after it's, uh, the, the first state it was in by just protecting badgers. So then people wanted to do harm, found, well, we'll just destroy the set and then there won't be any more badgers. And they did in the 70s and 80s. Um, so protection of badger sets was brought in. So it's really quite very clear this. The badger sets being disturbed, and some of this can be minor to the thing that baiters do, which is digging a crowning down hole. I've seen holes of 12 feet deep dug in a night. As they, as they put dogs down to get badgers out. Um, that, that is a gross crime, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not anything else. The issue then is how and when and with how much energy, if you like, that it's investigated. And again, I'm not being critical of police at all individually. I've had police in the last year where I've dealt with more cases individually who spent an enormous amount of time and trouble on this. Uh, and I have as well as the volunteer who turns out, you know, to try and help them. So I think that's something you're going to see improving in the future. I really do. And so we, we cut this gap between what we perceive as crimes, but could use RSPB sort of nomenclature, could be possible or probable crimes, so that we're clear what the definite crimes are. And there'll be some crimes of finding a perpetrator is extremely difficult, you know, that they've gone, that's it. So, no, of course the police won't put forward something for prosecution if there's nobody to prosecute, but it doesn't mean to say the crime hasn't been committed in the first place. Right, so in terms of the um, figures, as you've brought up figures at the moment, could you just clarify um, for the record, as I raised this in the, in the first session, about um, the concerns that you've highlighted in relation to the question which I asked on um, Wednesday the 18th, uh, of March 2015 and the concerns about what the Scottish Government reported and what is in the uh, in the um, wildlife crime report? Um, I, I think I can't answer that. I, I don't know. You know, um, I, I know what we discover and what we put forward. Um, some things we do hear about, uh, I think, more than we used to, whereas it, they used to just disappear, I think. This is almost before Police Scotland now. We're going back to, obviously... Um, I think, I would say getting a hold of information is a bit easier, but I, I don't think it's of the standard that we, we could have, certainly. Um, and what you're referring to, I know, I know the figures you're referring to, and I, I, I can't explain that, I, I just don't know. It's obviously concerning that in 2013-14, um, Scottish Government reports um, in their written answer to me that um, there, there were no um, crimes proceeded against and no... Um, no finding of a guilty verdict, and and that your um, your your comment your um, figures are different to that. So yeah. um, by certainly by um, seven were were recorded by the police, and and so I think that's something that if if, mm. if it's now on the record that it's important that um, we as a committee ask the um, police Scotland to respond to that and possibly the Scottish government as well. Yes, I mean, often um, in what I just said just before, 
a few minutes ago, um, we also don't know whether the police have had, for example, a conversation with the fiscal. We, we don't know about that. And it could be for good reason, and I'm totally accepting this. They say, we're not going to proceed with the case. I mean, they've got to have enough evidence. It's got to be worthwhile. It's got to be in the public interest. They, they need, you know, they need to better get a conviction. And I, I, along with what Pete said about but we can, we can totally accept that. I absolutely agree. Um, but we're, we're, we're somewhere down <laughs> in the pile, you know, about this sort of a pyramid of crimes the public think have happened to somebody appearing in court and being punished for it. Um, that there's accreditation in every sort of crime, obviously. Some are easier to investigate than others. And we come back to the fact we're talking about um, with delay in investigation, then evidence deteriorates in the countryside. That's a really difficult issue. Um, police try and get out as soon as they can, but even if there's something reported one day, I talked to a policeman that day, it'll be two or three days later when we do go out, if we're lucky, to do things like take photographs, um, and if they're called off on another job and we have to you know, make another arrangement for the next week, um, we have deterioration and that makes any idea of getting a conviction very difficult, I'd suggest. OK, um, let's move on and look at BATS. Morris Gold. Thank you, Convener. Um, these questions are primarily for you, Peter, but by all means, if there's any uh, other pertinent points, uh, please, uh, please drop in for the rest of the panel. Um, I think it was, it was pleasing to hear um, in some of your opening remarks about some of the preventative work going on. Uh, but likewise, um, earlier the committee heard that there's only been three offences recorded in 2013-14 and none 14-15. Uh, uh, and I was wondering from your perspective, do these figures accurate, accurately portray um, bat persecution levels? Well, I think they're in line with the national average across police forces. We, we are making um, referrals to the police across the UK between 120 and 150 annually. So to make nine referrals to Police Scotland last year uh, would show that actually that force are dealing with more back crimes than most. Uh, in terms of the number of crimes, uh, again, statistically, we, we think uh, some recent research carried out only over the last couple of years would suggest that of referrals to the police, one in six or seven cases uh, result in confirmed crimes. Um, so I think the, the Police Scotland uh, crime recording is pretty much in line with you know, what we would statistically expect. And do you think that more could be done in terms of raising public awareness uh, around what is perceived to be an incident or, or, a, or a crime in relation to BAT? I think certainly raising public awareness is, is, is an issue, but I think raising awareness amongst the industry, because the vast majority of BAT crime relates to development. So we think that working with industry is the key. Uh, we do lots of work on, on raising awareness, but I think as much as we try, we also have to be able to relate to cases and be able to say, if you choose not to comply with the law, these are the sort of sanctions you will face. Uh, and I think some recent cases uh, are, are sending that message out loud and clear that there is a need to comply with the law. I mean, I think I've picked up the, the gist of what you've said, but just to get uh, it on the record, if you like, uh, and using, you know, uh, your UK-wide uh, knowledge uh, with respect to this, are you content in the way that uh, Police Scotland and the Crown Office and uh, Procurator Fiscal Service are are, are operating uh, given that uh, obviously bat persecution is a wildlife crime priority? Yes, we are. There is not one case from last year that I referred to Police Scotland that I anticipated would go forward to prosecution. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, let's move on um, and look at the... Uh, uh, Kate Forbes has a series of questions. Brilliant, thank you. I'd quite like to ask um, a series of questions now on uh, poaching and coursing. The first question being, are you content with the way that poaching is currently recorded by Police Scotland and reported to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? 
And do you think the figures in the report reflect poaching levels in Scotland? Yes, probably the answer to that one. Uh, I've not had any... Uh, I've had my own issues with poachers. Uh, I'm a keeper, full-time keeper on the state within Edinburgh, South Queen's Ferry, and uh, we have big problems with poachers. That also goes on probably to the, the badger side as well, because a lot of these poachers are involved in all sorts of things to do with dogs. We actively, as an association, we actively uh, want our members to report any incidents to police, vehicle numbers, all the rest of it, and that adds up to the picture that eventually will be recorded, uh, hopefully, in the report as well. The undoubtedly... Um, Deer coursing and hare coursing is a, is a major problem, especially near the, uh, with dogs, uh, especially near the, the, the major towns in the central belt. Uh, fish poaching as well is the biggest crime that we now have as well. That's a massive thing going on just now. Our members that are stalkers, gillies, uh, big upon gillies uh, on the rivers, they, they, they report to the police and work very closely with the police as well. So I think from our point of view, I think the recording is reasonably robust, yeah. Would anybody else like to come in on that point? Can I, can I ask Andy Smith, does, does the, mem the involvement of your membership in this issue place them in, in danger at times? Because, you know, around here, Corson, for example, I'm aware of farmers who've had their property vandalised. I'll give you a personal example that happened to me, which actually resulted in me being charged by the police. It wasn't a very nice situation. My background, uh, just to let people know, is I was a, I was a police officer for 30 years. Um, involved in keeping all my life through my family and now full-time keeper. Three years ago, uh, I received a, a phone call from one of the farmers. This is due to the, the police were looking at specific, um, they were looking for specifically for this individual who was not a nice person at all. Um, the, I, I asked the local farmers, could you tell me if you see this car about? I got a phone call, yes, the car's there. So I went along with another retired officer who's 82. But, uh, uh, we went along and we found them uh, in the field. They were just coming out the field. Our, our um, protocol now is we don't approach these individuals. We stay well away. We phone the police and we let the police deal with them. We phone 999 as it's a crime that's actually happening. I phoned 99. Unfortunately, the timing was bad. Uh, they just came out of the field as I was on the phone. Fortunately, my police training was such as that I kept the phone open. I asked the operator to make sure that line was open. It recorded the conversation uh, between the poacher and myself. And I, I can assure you that had it not been for the fact that I had my 30 years of police training behind me, that uh, I would have undoubtedly reacted differently to that person, uh, to that individual. Uh, it resulted in him putting a counterclaim in, uh, and I was charged with a breach of the peace. That charge went to the, the Crown Office, and it was basically put a pen right through it when the the transcript of the uh, of the the conversation was was read i was lucky because i know the system if you like but a lot of guys don't know the system and they are out there on their own and there is conflict that is why we we say to people you don't approach these people watch them from afar phone the police and let the police do their job it's important to get this on the record because there's some fairly unsavoury individuals involved in some of these. They, they were not nice people. Yeah. He, the, the, this individual in particular, in my 30 years, I would say he's, he was one of the not nice people at all. Yeah. Um, not a nice person. OK, thank you for that. Um, let's look, return to raptor persecution. Um, Mark Rusko. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I, I mean, I think I caught both RSPB and SGA earlier on both saying that it's useful to have greater transparency over cases. It, could you sort of expand a bit, a bit more on that in terms of the withheld data? From our point of view, I would suggest that, that, that we're trying to move forward. Everybody's trying to move forward. That's what we're trying to do. We've gone, if, as I said, if you go back 25, 30 years ago, it was not in a nice place. When the poisonings, for example, were at the 32, it was a way back in, in the day. It's, it's going, it's on a downward trend, which is great. But then when we get things which, I'm not, I'm not saying they're, they're almost perceived to be withheld, we should be working together, trying to, trying to move on. That's what, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate our members as best we can. We don't police our organisation. We, um, we react if anything's happened, which has resulted in five of our members being um, put out of the organisation, and these members, as I said earlier, would like, very likely lose their, their firearms, their shotguns, and very likely their, 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 their jobs, and probably their houses as well. So it's got a big knock-on effect to us, and we really do want to get the message across. And we need all the tools available to do that. 
when things, as I said earlier about the eagles that were held back, these eight eagles that were held back from us, that should have been in, in everybody's interest so that we can try and use that positively. The difficulty is that when cases have been publicised, in actual fact, two or three years ago, there was a case where we, before it was publicised and the police investigations was finished, um, we shared the information with the Scottish Gamekeepers Association and they carried out their, their own investigation, and, and I use that term loosely. And what they came up with, the, 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 what had happened was a satellite tag Golden Eagle was found under a tree with two smashed legs. And the satellite tag data showed that that bird had been held in one place for 15 hours, um, high up on a grouse moor 15 miles away. Then after dark, the bird mysteriously moved these 15 miles to be found under a tree on D side, about 30 metres from a road. It was fairly clear from the post, the post-mortem report said that the injuries on, on that bird were consistent with it being caught in an illegal trap. Uh, we asked the SGA to assist to see if they could find out what on earth had happened and basically they then produced a, a, a sort of fairy tale of un, a series of unfortunate events that apparently happened to this bird that were so far away from being supported by the evidence to being laughable, to be perfectly honest. And we've done this on several occasions, tried to work with SG before cases go into the public domain, and frankly, have, you know, it has not been productive. That's the bottom line. With regard to withholding information, uh, and accusations were not following protocols. Uh, there's a suggestion that perhaps if a satellite tag Golden Eagle goes missing suspiciously, that we go and chap on the door of the big hoose and say, do you mind if we go and look for this Golden Eagle that we suspect may have been illegally killed, thereby giving the perpetrators every opportunity to go and clear up before we found it. We're not going to do that. That's the reality. But in terms of the report and the withheld data in the report, you know, I referenced your own report, Ian Thompson, earlier on, and you know, the picture of the of the of the set trap and everything else. Why why isn't that information in the report? And would you both welcome those kind of incidents coming into this report? Because yes. otherwise, I can't see how we're getting an accurate picture of what wildlife crime is. I, I don't understand why that incident isn't in the report because that picture was taken on an operation that was being led by the police. There were three police officers present, as well as Scottish SPCA officials and RSPB staff, at which we uncovered a pretty appalling number of scenes uh, on the middle of this estate that were confirmed illegal crimes. I can't answer why they, they aren't in the report. They should be. I mean, it, it, could you speculate whether well, there a valid reason why it wouldn't be? Is there an ongoing investigation? I, mean, I just didn't feel there was much of an answer from it's, Police Scotland. It sounds a bit bizarre why it's not in. If the, RSB, uh, if the RSPB are saying, uh, saying that they were there with the police, then it should be in the report, I would suggest. OK, and can also just ask you about this. I suspect I, I'll know what the answer is going to be, but the 19% increase in offences that's taken place, is that largely down to reporting or is that an increase in in persecution? I think it's very dangerous to become fixated on a body count um, because the finding, particularly of raptor persecution offences, is largely dependent on luck. There's a very ad hoc search effort and it actually means comparing statistics from one year to another is actually quite invalid in many, many ways. We never know from one year to the next whether we're finding 5% of offences or 50% or 95%. All we can see is it's continuing. And I think what the uh, Assistant Chief Constable said earlier on about using the sort of open source information, the scientific studies that are being carried, the population censuses, are much more valid in allowing us to identify where raptor persecution continues to be an issue. For example, areas where hen harriers ought to be doing very, very well, but have declined steadily for 30 years, as was published at the start of this year. Peregrine falcons in northeast Scotland, 
Um, we're now at a situation where the Kieran Gorms National Park in, in the Aberdeenshire but had a quarter of the number of breeding peregrines that it had in 1991. These are the sort of things that show you where persecution is occurring as opposed to whether somebody luckily walked the right side of a wood or a, or a clump of rocks and stumbled across a body. Smith, what's your, your view on that? Well, I think, firstly, I think we should just remember that the Cairn Gorn National Park has got the highest density of eagles in the world. Let's not, let's not, uh, am I not right in thinking that? No. Where is it? Certainly, in, certainly in, in the UK. Harris, I Harris has got the highest density of eagles. Scotland anyway, so Scotland. we have it, so which is good anyway. So the, I, I think that um, where we... I've kind of lost the track. Of that one. Just tell, the increase, the 19% increase in offences. What you put that down I, I to? Think is it's that probably, reporting or is that increased persecution? I think it's. I think it's probably down to increased reporting and people being more aware of what's happening in the uh, countryside. That, that's what I think. I, I believe in uh, that people are much more aware of what's going on now, uh, which is due to um, media releases. Um, we all do our best, as I said, to try and to, to try and reduce that. But I think it's down to, to people being more aware. And are you happy with the way that birds and raptor persecutions are detailed or recorded actually in the report, are broken down? Or could that be improved in some way? It's, it, there is a, a degree of confusion about bird crime, which I presume is all birds, and raptor crime. I think the actual birds, wider birds, if we're focusing on the national wildlife crime priorities, it should focus on raptors. Um, whereas birds more widely could mean somebody shot a blackbird with an ear gun, which unpleasant though that is, um, it isn't one of the wildlife crime priorities. So I think actually focusing on raptors rather than all birds would be clearer in the report. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I think you probably need um, both in there as well, you, specifically for raptors. If you're going down, if you're wanting to have raptor as a, as a key issue, then it has to be uh, reported that way. And I would agree with it that bird defences can cover all sorts of things. Claudia Beamish. Right, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, could I go back very briefly to the poaching issue? Because there was actually a supplementary question I wanted to ask you, um, Andy Smith, um, in relation to the um, Scottish Gamekeepers Association's written submission. And uh, it's noted in the report that um, fish poaching remains the only type of recorded wildlife crime where there is a measurable increase in both 2015 up by 12% and over a five year. Um, data period up 19%. And you highlight um, the concerns about um, uh, public perception and whether the focus is on other, maybe on other priority um, species. And obviously salmon is a protected species as is sea trout. And I wonder if you could make any further comment on that and where you see the emphasis and if you'd like to see any changes. I, I think it's for itself. I know the gillies, and the, uh, certainly down in the river, not just the gillies, but the, the, the bailiffs as well, they're doing a, a fantastic job down in, on, on the rivers uh, through Scotland. I would say that it's just, let's keep going and try and, try and catch them. That's, that's the bottom line, and I would suggest. Uh, and there's not much more I can add to that one. Can I, can I just wrap up this, this session on, on raptor persecution? Um, Andy Smith, you, you referenced earlier the fact that you weren't an organisation that could police its membership as such, you can do the, the things you do. And you've been quite unequivocal as an organisation about your view of raptor persecution, I accept that. But on the ground, you may well have individual gamekeepers who are subject to pressures, localised pressures, to act in a way, I speculate, that might be abhorrent to the SGA and to all of us. Um, do you accept that that may be happening and it may be the cause of these hotspots that we still have um, you know, concerning raptor persecution? Individuals, individuals are going to be responsible for their own actions, no matter what that is. Uh, I, I wouldn't like to speculate that that's why we have hotspots or we have perceived hotspots or whatever we have. I, I think that each individual has a, their own responsibility. And as I said earlier, it goes on with the job that you do. If, you, if, you have, if you're a keeper out, uh, up on a hill somewhere, before you pull that trigger, you've got a lot going through your head. It's very similar to a drunk driver going into a car. You've got the keys in your hand, you've got the gun in your hand, you've had a drink, what do I do? Drink driving continues, and let's just hope it's reducing all the time, as is the Raptor crime as well. 
likelihood of being caught for drunk driving is statistically high. I think there was 19,000 vehicles stopped over the festive season. Yeah. Wildlife crime that occurs of all types in remote areas, you're much white, less likely to be caught. So perhaps that's you know at the root of this. It's so, uh, up to each individual at the end of the day. We as an organisation certainly don't condone it, and we certainly don't want it in our organisation. And we try our best to try and say don't do it, but individuals will be individuals. And of course, there's a number of gamekeepers have nothing to do with the SGA, for example. We, we only have we have somewhere in the region of 1,200 actual for for membership is about 5,000. We have 1,200 that are actual gamekeepers. That's not um, you know not every teacher is a member of the NUT, so you know I can't speak for every gamekeeper. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, Dave Stewart. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Um, what assessment have you made on the case for increasing the powers of SSPCA to investigate wildlife crime? Mr Thompson. There was an interesting example recently in a, a couple of walkers uh, stumbled across a common gull that was, was flapping about in a trap on a moor. And the, the walkers contacted us, and because there was, this bird was severely injured, we contacted the Scottish SPCA to send an inspector up there because of the animal welfare concerns. And the, the, the inspe we also reported the, the incident to the police, but the, the police weren't able to get back to us very quickly. The SSPCA attended within an hour. Uh, the gull was euthanised, and the illegal trap was seized. Um, and there then followed a sort of joint investigation with the police, SSPC, and, and RSPB involved. It was a week before a follow-up search was able to take place because the SSPC officer's powers did not give him the right to search more widely to see if there was other similar traps set in that location. But when we returned a week later with the police, it was very clear that a further four sets of traps had been deployed in a line across that and we were baited with dead rabbits to attract birds of prey or whatever. But all that was left was the holes where the traps had been staked into the ground and the, you could see the indentation in the moss and everything like that. I would argue very strongly that that case was a very good example why the SSPC powers should at least allow them to enter land if there is suspicion that wildlife crime offences under the Wildlife and Countryside Act are taking place. Now, I know they're not looking for powers of entry to search buildings or vehicles under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. They just want the ability to enter land. I certainly strongly support it. That's a very powerful point. Uh, Mr Smith? Yeah. I think, like everything else, I think that the SSPCA, firstly, are a charitable organisation, which was which was suggested earlier by the police as well. Um, my my own experience of that was quite recently, actually, when I was actually very surprised about what I found out, and I was asked to go down to Oatridge uh, College um, in Broxburn, um, where we took part in a, a careers convention, and we were there on behalf of the, the Scottish gamekeepers. We met the, the two chief inspectors from the SSPCA that were there, and while we were talking to them, found out that the 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 um, I don't think it was the chief executive. I think he's away, but the the chief superintendent had actually was down in London uh, in the House of Commons to listen to the driven grouse debate, and that's where I've caught a kind of issue on it that, that whilst I understand that you, you know you can listen to we all probably listen to it but we we'll listen to it on the telly but this particular individual went down to London to listen to the Driven Grace debate it's a charitable organisation that, that, that as far as we see has got a, perhaps an agenda where shooting is on their agenda and he, he was certainly at that event by, by the information that was given to me by the two chief inspectors that were there and I just find that quite strange Okay, Mr. Palmer. Yeah, I, I refer back to your point earlier about this might be an added workforce, and certainly uh, one of our difficulties is that SSPCA deal with some badger cases, and they can take them forward. We, we don't. Sometimes they tell us about them, sometimes they don't. So their figures are really on the top of ours, I think. But uh, I've seen their speed of response in Scotland, for instance. So they can have a couple of people up, you know, in the north of Scotland within hours because there's some live case happening. So uh, I think our view is that there'd be an added workforce, basically leaving out some of the other issues that have been mentioned. Mm. Thank you. In our response to the consultation, we raised some concerns about the SSPCA having additional powers, and we, we asked some clarity as to 
whether the powers would be under Wildlife and Countryside Act or, or whether they would be more general powers to address wildlife crime, such as powers under protection of badges or powers under the habitat regulations. And the reason our concern is, is we want clarity as to who is to investigate wildlife crime in Scotland. Is it the police? Uh, are they the ultimate authority? We need to be able to go to somebody to say, this is your responsibility, we want you to enforce it. We fear that by giving SSPCA powers, we may then get into a tussle between Police Scotland and the SSPCA, with one saying, you know, we don't do that, report it to the other. Providing there is clarity as to who has ultimate responsibility, we would welcome those additional powers being given. I'm sure you'd have picked up the questions I made at the earlier session, when certainly my, from my perspective, is, is no one's arguing about taking away the primacy of Police Scotland, it's about enhancing the team. And clearly we also heard that it's important to get the legal drafting correct, that's a mark for the government, and clearly there's human rights issues as well. C can I move on to penalties for wildlife crime? You're all be familiar with the, uh, uh, the Pusty report, uh, which made recommendations for increasing penalties, which I outlined earlier. Can I ask each of the panel members their assessment of these increased penalties, these recommendations for increased penalties? Mr Charleston. I think an increase in penalty is to be welcomed. Um, we know that if you have a bat roost on your development, as a commercial developer, it is going to cost you at least £5,000 to deal with that roost lawfully. Now, clearly, if, if penalties of less than £5,000 are imposed, there is a danger of the message going out that crime can pay. So I think uh, having the ability to impose increased penalties is going to help there. But as I mentioned earlier, I think um, probably more importantly for us is the um, ability to seek proceeds of crime confiscation orders, uh, which are, are, of course, not penalties, but nevertheless will be seen as much by many. Thank you, Mr Palmer. No, I, I, I agree with what uh, Pete's just said. I, I think um, increased penalties would be welcomed. Um, the, the, pub, the public vent their frustration on us when there are badger crimes, either nobody's found for it or somebody appears in court and gets what appears to be a very light sentence, you know. And I think they sometimes forget, I think the average fine in a sheriff court is £250, actually. So, you know, when we have some people who have been fined £700 or £1,000, that's maybe not bad going. But um, I, I think they need to be ramped up, yeah. Mr Smith? Yeah, I, I agree with it. I think. I think anything's going to act as a deterrent is going to be good. As I said earlier on about the thing, you've also got the add-on of loss of jobs, earnings, all the rest of it as well. Yeah. Mm. Mr Thompson? Um, I agree. I mean, we, we, we were able to make both a, a written and a verbal submission to the, the penalties review panel, which we were um, very pleased to, to take part in. And as, as I said earlier on, we agreed wholeheartedly with the recommendations made. Um, the one thing I would add is, is there are certain aggravating features with some wildlife crimes where people are doing it as part of their role and there is, a, and there is a, a, an element of, of um, premeditation which obviously should be included as an aggravating feature as well. So, Can I ask what you mean by your, the role? People are doing it as part of their employment, as part of their job. In what respect? Killing birds of prey. That's not part of my job. No, no, it's not part of it's your not job. part of my job or any mm, keeper's yeah. job. That's very, very yeah. should be yeah, yeah. that's passion there, I'm sorry, but that's no, no. too far. Perhaps if we just finish <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the other point worth stressing, which came from the Crown Office, is uh, speed uh, speed of delivery in the sense of getting the convictions important. So obviously under summary, which tends to be much quicker, um, that's certainly worth looking at because the maximum offence, if that goes ahead, would be 40,000, maximum penalty would be £40,000 uh, and a year imprisonment. But under solemn procedure, um, you're, you're talking about uh, an increase um, of five years imprisonment. So it's obviously getting these things balanced out, but certainly it's useful to get your feedback. And clearly we need to wait for government. And if we've got an opportunity, convener, uh, if we have the cabinet secretary, and I'm sure we can speak specifically about the timescale that government intends to take this legislation back to us. But thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, Angus MacDonald. Thanks, um, Convener. Um, you'll have heard my question to the previous panel regarding uh, vicarious liability and the response from Sean Scott, in which he indicated he'd be keen to see more convictions through vicarious liability uh, uh, provisions. So do you think, um, with the advent of the public register, 
of uh, controlling interests, that that will allow uh, for more vicarious liability convictions and um, prosecutions and sentences through uh, through through that um, act. Uh, will, will, will they become? Would you regard these as a deterrent, a successful deterrent? Yes, in short, I think um, the vicarious liability provisions have. Um, whether that is coincident with the reduction in poisoning that has, has clearly happened in, in Scotland over the last five years is, is up for debate. Obviously, there's been increased, increased use of things like satellite transmitters as well, but I think vicarious liability has had a marked deterrent effect. And I think having a land register which will help the police to identify those responsible for managing shooting on an area of ground is very, very important. Okay. Yes, I would agree as well. No, no, I think it's all been said before. I think, it's, uh, I think everything, everything helps at the end of the day. Yes, same by me as well. Um, sometimes we are asked to go and look at a badger set and we have no idea who owns the land and finding out who it is very difficult and a landowner, absentee or not, can just wash their hands and say, oh, you know, people came on my land, nothing to do with me at all. Yes, I agree. We, we've never had cause to investigate that issue. Uh, most prosecutions for back crime actually um, involve corporate uh, responsibilities and liability, uh, including legislation for those. OK. OK, thank you. Um, uh, Finlay Carson. I think we've covered a lot of this already uh, during the, the questioning, but you know, it, we've been very aware over the last five years that, uh, of, of satellite tracking, um, and in some cases a lot of it's not been treated as, as criminal uh, incidents by the police. What I would like to know is what steps have RSPB and other organisations who own the satellite tags taken to liaise with owners and managers of the land. I know you've already said you're not going to bang in the, the door of the big house. So what actually uh, do you do uh, when satellite uh, signals disappear um, and in compliance with it, the protocol? What, how do you actually make an effort to understand better what's actually happened? When a uh, bird, th th there are two things that can happen, or three things that can happen with a satellite tagged bird. It can either carry on flying around quite happily, and you will obviously be able to follow its, its track uh, when it transmits its signal, or perhaps you will see that, that there is potentially a concern about that, that bird may be da dead, um, in which case the signal will stop moving, in which case what you will do is look at the satellite tag data and try and establish if the bird has stopped moving and is still transmitting. Because if a bird's lying dead, then the transmitter is still going to function. And you'll continue to get data, and that will allow you to go and recover the, recover the body. In those circumstances, what we will do is we'll contact the, the local divisional police. We'll have a discussion with regard to, this is what this data is showing us. And we'll, we will see to them, do you wish to come with us to look for the body, or are you happy for us to collect it? In those cases, it is often impossible to tell whether the bird has died naturally or whether it has been a victim of an illegal crime or not. However, you have to go onto that ground on the basis that there has been a potential wildlife crime victim because often these birds are going down in areas that have a history of confirmed raptor persecution incidents, for example, previous poisonings, trapping, shootings, whatever. So you have to go there on that basis. That doesn't necessarily mean that individual bird will be a victim or not. However, there are other cases where a tag that is functioning very, very well suddenly stops transmitting. These tags are incredibly reliable. Um, something like 6% of them fail. So in other words, 94% of them are, are going to continue working. So for a tag to suddenly stop transmitting, that means something fairly catastrophic has happened to that tag. Now, what we will do is, again, liaise with the police in exactly the same way. We'll see this bird was in this last known position when it stopped transmitting. 
do you want to come and have a look around that area with us or are you happy for us to go and do it yourselves? But we are concerned that this is suspicious. And they will say there is no evidence of a crime, we're happy for you to go. So that's basically why we, how we act in terms of one, when one of these birds disappears or stops moving. There's, there, there's obviously, the, the Cabinet Secretary was asked, uh, uh, and, she, and she's undertaking a review at the moment of satellite, satellite tracking data, whatever, and the report's expected in 2017. Did uh, you make a submission to that review, and, and what's your initial thoughts of what it might come out and tell us? Um, we, obviously, RSPB monitors a number of satellite tagged species, uh, notably golden eagles, red kites, white tailed eagles, and hen harriers. And the people undertaking the review have asked us to contribute all our data. So we are in the process of pooling that together. I wouldn't like to uh, preempt the findings of the review before it was published, but I think it'll be very interesting reading. Can I ask um, for a point of information, clar genuine clarity for myself here, because cutting through the claim and counter claim about the, the whole issue of, of raptor persecution is very challenging. I'd just like some clarity from those of you who understand birds far better than I do. To what extent nest disturbance can be detrimental at the point where you're trying to uh, apply the satellite tags? And I asked the question because I saw a series of pictures on the internet a few weeks ago where uh, they purport to show uh, the process of tagging uh, eaglet chicks, too, um, with people sitting around having their lunch in the vicinity of the net, the, the nest, uh, a dog being present. It appears to have taken a sustained period to do this. There was one point where the eagle chick was being petted and people were taking photographs. Now, just for clarity, would that have any detrimental impact? Would the nest be abandoned by the adult eagles? What? There was a study carried out in, forgive me if I can't be specific about the dates, but I think it was in the early 90s, where adult golden eagles were trapped on their nests. And that was uh, to be fitted with, with satellite tags. And that was found to be having a, a negative impact on whether the birds would return to those nest sites to breed in subsequent years. And because of that, the whole system of tagging was basically changed. Now, obviously, satellite tags are a fairly new piece of technology, and there is a learning process with them. Um, there was another study carried out that showed that a couple of red kites uh, in England had been found to, the tag had been fitted incorrectly, and the birds had suffered lesions. Um, but again, that was identified, I think, to just one or two individuals. Satellite tagging involves A, a person to have a license, B, for them to undergo a rigorous training regime, C, for them to submit a license return, and D, obviously, it's very clear what happens to a tagged bird after it's been fitted with the tag. Now, all that information, certainly the, the, the success of the tagged bird, will be feed into the tagging review, I'm quite sure, because obviously it's one of the birds that can contribute to this. There were a number of allegations made in relation to those photographs, which I also did see, that frankly were false. That's the bottom line. The people involved were carrying out operations that were entirely permissible within standard practice and had been, been permitted by the British Trust for Ornithology, but some of the other spurious allegations related to them were frankly a bid, as far as I'm concerned, to try and undermine the satellite tagging review before it's published by suggesting birds come to harm by satellite tags. I would suggest we wait to see what the review publishes and then we'll see what harm is coming to tag birds. Yeah, I, I, I'm still looking for the background because as a layman, when you look at these pictures, you do wonder why people would be sitting having their lunch round about an eagle's nest. And I'm interested in, as to whether that would be standard practice or behaviour when you were going through a process that, as you say, requires training and licensing. As you know, eagles nest on cliffs by and large are up trees. And if there happen to be four or five people attending on the day, then not, not all four or five of them are going to go up the tree mm. or up the cliff. Mm. They'll wait for the person who's either 
retrieving the chick to do the tagging or taking the chick back up to the nest. And if they happen to sit and have their lunch there, so be it. They're not there for three, four hours, as was alleged by some people. In general terms, the process of, of satellite tagging young birds is not detrimental to their, their survival? No, 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 not at all. OK. Andy Smith, do you well, want to... I don't know how long it takes to tag an eagle, because I've never done it, and, and I don't know how long it would take. So I, I really... I saw the pictures like everyone else, and just from a layman's term as well, a layman's view as well, I think to have a dog anywhere near there is not right, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that they were a false picture, so that's quite good that... You said they were false. Okay, th thank you for that information because it's just useful to get some clarity around that issue. Um, these are hugely important matters we've discussed today, and we'll continue as a committee to take an interest in it within and out with the process of looking at the annual report. So, uh, thank you very much for your time today, gentlemen. It's been most useful. Um, I, what am I going to do now? I'm going to suspend. <laughs> um, the next meeting uh, on the 17th of January, the committee will take evidence from various academics and experts on deer management in Scotland and also consider subordinate legislation. As agreed earlier, we now move into private session. I ask the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed. Thank you.